I don't know, I have to do a lot of meditation and stuff to like help deal with that. I think this business generates a lot of anxiety. Oh, it absolutely does. Yeah. Yeah. Because things it, change and they don't tell you why. And Oh, there's control issues. There's yeah. egos you're dealing with. There's high stakes. There's, sure. I mean, like you said, the, this matters. This is important. I want to do a great job. I want to impress someone. And that anxiety, yeah, it can really, it, it can it can shut you down. It can yeah. make you react badly. It can make, it true. can cause your worst self to come out. Yeah, it, it can, and the focus is in the wrong direction. You're focusing inward as opposed to out. You know, when you're in the arts, you should be looking out, not in. Where does your positive outlook come from? That's an interesting question because I wonder if I I struggle. Okay, I'll say it this way: I struggle with the positive outlook. I know that um, when I'm speaking or when I'm teaching, I strive very much to put that out there because I want that energy. Um, but it is something I have to work on. It is, it, I, I am naturally a cynical person um, and I have to watch that. Uh, there's a book called The Happiness Advantage. If you've ever read it, it's an excellent book about the study of joy uh, and how powerful it is in someone's life. Um, for example, if you say your car breaks down, your engine block overheats or something. And if you walk out there to try to fix your car and you're angry and, ah, oh, darn my stupid car, I gotta fix this. Your mind shuts down. Instead of, if, as opposed to if you go to the car problem and you go, all right, how are we gonna fix this problem now? Your mind, that studies show that your mind is 30% more active when you approach a, pro a problem with joy as opposed to cynicism. So same, same with being on a film set or whatever. If you're angry and cynical and frustrated, you are less creative. That is so vital to understand. Now I know this and knowing that I struggle with cynicism, I have to every day reframe it. Um, that's where it comes from. It's, it, it's, uh, that's where it starts. But also it comes from like, I love this job. I love this industry. I, we, we are working all of us in one of the coolest industries there is. And it's, it's like moths to the flame, right? If any, you know, I'm sure you've done it where you've done an interview somewhere or shooting, it doesn't matter how big or small it is, people will stop and ask, what are you, what are you guys shooting? It's because everybody's drawn to it. Uh, it there's a magic to it and I, I can't get enough of it. I mean, I've sacrificed everything to get here. So like, why be mad? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people who are in this industry. I, I never understood that. Um, cause I mean, like me personally, I, I don't have kids because of this industry. Like I never felt like my career was to, you know, I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready. So, you know, here I am many years later and I don't have children. A lot of people leave their families and homes to get to LA, for example. Uh, so why be frustrated and angry about that? It just, this is a joy. We get to meet people. Most people don't get to meet. We get to see and go into buildings or countries or whatever that most people don't get to do and it's we get to move people and educate people and we can change minds and perspectives and i don't know if i find myself getting cynical and angry i have to remind myself of that how much how lucky i am to get to do this you know it's uh it's it's amazing i think too there's an there's like this accepted um I'm at a loss for words, but with, with being in LA, maybe maybe other big cities, there's an accepted cynicism. If you're too happy-go-lucky and joyous, mm. which people, it might be someone's natural state, it may, may not, but people will be like, oh, what are they trying to sell me? So I yeah, think here, that, there's an accepted cynicism. That could be. It's, uh, it's so weird. I, yeah, and the, you know, I will say for LA, so I, I grew up, in other cities. I'm, I'm from Portland, Oregon initially, and I've lived all over the country, and then I've only lived in LA for a few years now. There is a slightly different energy, but I will say it's only in pockets in LA, it's certain sides of the city. Um, and I think you can choose to draw that energy, energy towards you, you know, the more positive side. I don't think you want to be around the cynicism side. I try not to, to be around people who emanate that energy because it will affect you, like it, it, it'll affect your work. It'll change what you're doing as a storyteller. Um, and it's, I think, a, this doesn't necessarily refer to your question, but all of us are sold on what this industry is. You know, we all fell in love with film at some point, right? 
and we're sold on the dream that you will be plucked out of obscurity, like the claw toy, at the, you know, the little toy thing that picks the claw up. You want toys are the claw. We're all sold on this idea, like Spielberg. You know, he meets the, whoever it was, the president of whatever it was, Universal or something, grooms him to be in TV, and then by 23, he directs Jaws. You know, that's what we're sold on. Robert Rodriguez does his first movie for $6,000, and boom, the head of, what was it, CAA or something, like finds him and sweeps him into stardom. We're sold on that idea. Um, the reality is that's not normal. That's obscure. Most people don't do that. So they end up working their way up, working in some sort of job that didn't look the way they thought it would look. Uh, I had a friend who was working on a television show as a uh, camera operator for the most part and then a cinematographer once in a while. And it was a terrible TV show. Like, and he complained about it endlessly. Like, oh man, I oh, just, and he tells me one day, yeah, I'm working on the show, but I'm embarrassed to tell anyone I'm working on it because the show is so bad. Simultaneously, I am telling him I would give anything to direct one of those episodes. I don't care if it's bad, but here we are. Both, both of us are looking at the show, the terrible show, with, from two different directions, right? I would give anything just for the chance to direct on it. He's embarrassed to tell anyone he's working on it. Both of us are unhappy. And I'm like, dude, you're working on a TV show. Like, how cool is that? And you're, you're upset about it. It's because it doesn't look like what we, the picture that we were sold when we were younger, you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it just, it, you know, opportunity just arrived differently and we're just, well, I'm not working, my budget's not big enough or I'm not working with X, Y, Z actor or whatever it is that your mental picture of success looks like or industry work looks like. It's, uh, we have to throw that away. Um, I had a really e a big epiphany that happened to me years ago. I, you know, I was sold on that same dream. You know, I fell in love with movies when I was, I don't know, very, very young. I grew up in the golden age of Spielberg. You know, I remember when Raiders came out and I remember when like uh, Close Encounters had a huge impact on me. I went home and uh, imagined the film in my head because I didn't have access to a camera. So I just had to close, I literally went in my room, closed my eyes and thought the film through from beginning to end just to try to capture all those images I saw. Fell in love with it from that point forward. And I was sold on the dream where you'll go there and you'll get plucked. Well, so I sacrifice everything to get into the industry um, and I can't, I, I, no one will hire me, right? I get out of college and I can't find a job. I can't do anything. And I ended up moving to Nashville and working on low end music videos. And then I got into corporate work and I was so frustrated all the time. So like, because I was doing these industrial films and these you know, educational videos and I wasn't making movies. And I was, I found, I realized that I was angry all the time because I wasn't where I thought I should be, whatever that means. And I realized one day that, so what am I going to do? Am I just going to be angry until I get to where I think I should be? Like, is, is it what, is it going to be an angry switch? I'm going to turn it off. Because I'm putting out a lot of toxic waste, you know, and my energy is going to keep me from getting hired. You know, people meet me and I'm just emanating this negative vibe. Like, are they really going to want to pull me up to another level to work on something else? Simultaneously with that, I watched Jurassic Park. Okay. <laughs> Great film, right? Well, in the middle of Jurassic Park, there's, the, you remember the segment where it's, um, the characters have to learn about, we, or the audience has to learn about how are dinosaurs made, right? Remember this little thing? And the characters in the movie watch this little video about dino DNA. Remember this? Where they're on the little ride and there's every 65 million years ago, a mosquito <laughs> jumps on a dinosaur and then lands on a tree branch and gets caught in the sand. You know, you remember that? Like, and then they extract they, that little whole video about how they got the blood from a dinosaur back then. And then, you know, this is dino DNA. That whole little, little Mr. DNA or whatever the DNA cartoon strand was, right? Well, you know what that is? That's Steven Spielberg making a corporate video, right? It's an instructional video. It's, it's a very memorable part of the film. It's one, when I bring it up, most people remember it because it had a big impact. It's very important. 
for Jurassic Park, because otherwise the audience won't understand what's going on, how we got dinosaurs. Um, do you think Spielberg, you know, cussed and kicked his feet and moaned about the fact that he had to make an informational video in the middle of Jurassic? No, he didn't. He was like, how can we make this fun, right? So I'm looking at that and those kinds of videos are what I'm working on. Well, what if I just pretended that I was making a bigger film and this is just one little piece? And that decision, that day I switched, turned that switch, it changed everything. It suddenly my job became fun because I started thinking, well, okay, it's just an interview with the CEO, but what if this is part of my bigger, you know, whatever, what it may, whatever fantasy movie I want to come up with, it's an action adventure, but we have this little thing. How would I shoot this if this were a movie? My work improved. The clients noticed. The job started getting better. They started giving me bigger budgets. And eventually some of those turned into narrative things. And now today I have actually carved out a niche in the corporate world doing narrative storytelling for corporations, short films. I just finished one that's a choose your own adventure film for a hospital network. It was the most fun job I've had in a long time. It's not a feature film. You'll never see it in a theater, but it was great. And you're helping people like, and the best part, I'm getting paid to make shorts. I'm working with actors, I'm writing scripts, I'm getting paid to do it, you know, as I work my way up in the industry. And I've also gotten feature films based on that work. So that whole mindset helped me a ton. It was, it was, it was life changing. It seems like you like a sense of play with yeah. everything that you do. And yeah. do you think that that brings like this spark to it and that kind of squashes some of the cynicism? Yeah, it does. It absolutely does. And I think it's important. Um, you know, that comes with not taking yourself too seriously as well. And again, like I said before, it's, what's the point of taking yourself so seriously? We're, what we're doing is fun. Literally just today, I had a phone call, a conference call with a client about the most standard corporate video you can imagine. You know, it's an interview with the CEO with B-roll of the company. Now, the temptation is to just go, oh. But instead, to try to make it fun, because it's fun, I'd rather do that than flip burgers or bartend. That's, that is my option. You know, so let's, let's have some fun with it. And guess what? You know what the client said on the phone? They're like, man, no one's ever come into our company with this kind of energy before. Like you make it fun and you make, because we love our company and you're actually like embracing what we're doing. It's great. Like, this is great. So yeah, absolutely. I think it's vital for survival. It'll help you get work. It'll help you keep going. It's helped me for sure. Where does your work ethic come from? Because I also see, it seems like you have a very strong work ethic. Yeah, I, probably my parents, you know, my, my, both my fathers and my mother, like they've, they're, um, taught me the value of hard work as a child, you know, <laughs> being lazy was a big thing in my household. You know, <laughs> I was called lazy a lot when I was a kid. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. And, and especially the integrity of, um, when no one's looking doing the work anyway. You know, my dad was like that, you know, when he would, he wouldn't just go to work and then go home and drink a beer. He'd go home and he'd read a book about what he's doing. He would find ways to improve his craft in some way. That's, and if you want to make it, not just work in, the indus, in this industry, but if you want to make it in this, you better be doing that, like finding ways to improve it beyond. Because it, it really is, what you do in the dark and when no one's looking, you know, what that's where your metal is. And I think that's important. Yeah. So it definitely comes from them. Growing up in Oregon was the plan to get into film. <sighs> Boy, you know, so when I grew up, um, yeah, I mean, I fell in love with film at a very early age, but you know, and every filmmaker you know had the story of, oh, my dad gave me a camera when I was a fetus and I was <laughs> filming my own birth or whatever. Uh, that was not me. Um, I, <laughs> my mother is very religious and movies were considered evil and tools of the devil. I was, am still told that Hollywood is the lion's den and this is where I will lose my soul. Um, so there was that. My dad was a machinist, uh, you know, a salt of the earth, you know, 
you know, an engineer kind of person. And like, he just didn't understand it. So like, there was no one in my life that knew this, but I just wanted it so bad. I'll never forget the day when I was at the beach with my dad and I look over and a grip truck pulls up. Now I'm young. I, I don't know how young I was, but young, young enough, but I recognized what it was. I saw that back door open up and it's full of sea stands and sandbags and lights. And I swear my feet left the ground and I just wanted to like go to it. Like I didn't, I don't know what they were doing over there, but it looked like magic. And my dad just looks at me like, you really want to be over there, don't you? <laughs> like, you know, he was sort of smirking and smiling, you know, not in a negative way, but, but whatever the case, I was denied this. Like it, it, there was no access I had. I, before I could drive, I wasn't given the camera. Um, the only thing I had was a tape recorder. So I would record um, my stories on, you know, just with audio. And I ended up writing a novel when I was in grade school because I just had no access to anything. It wasn't until I got my driver's license when I could go to the public cable access station and borrow their camera. That was how I first got into it. Um, I don't know if they still do that, but that's a wonderful resource. It was for me at that time. But I didn't know, I never had a mentor. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know anyone who did this for a living. I went to school and majored in communications, which didn't help me at all, really. They didn't, I didn't even know about film festivals. I didn't understand LA. I was terrified of the big cities. And of course, I got the weight of, that's the lion's den, weighing over me. So I didn't know what to do. Um, and I, when I got out of college, I didn't know about internships. I didn't understand how to do that. So when I got out of school, I worked a dead-end job for two years. And I was so depressed because I wasn't even on the ladder to get to where I wanted to go. I had one friend that I knew in Nashville, Tennessee, and he said, well, you know, you are a musician and you like film, so there's a lot of that here. You could try Nashville. I'm like, I, I'll do anything. So I moved there without knowing, even knowing my roommate. I just moved. Oh, wow. And I'm gonna go. Oh, no. And even when I got there, though, I still had the same problem. Like, I didn't know anyone. I didn't know what to do. I, I worked waiting tables at the Olive Garden <laughs> at night leaving my days open so I could intern somewhere, but no one wanted me. And I had to, and again, there was no plan. I just, I was desperate to do anything to, you know, just let me look at the work being made. I don't care. And that's what I ended up telling people. You don't need to give me a job. Just um, let me watch the work being made. I don't, just let me be in the room when it's happening. And eventually one guy said, okay, you can watch me work. <laughs> It sounds so creepy, but it's, that's exactly how it started. And, and so that sort of was, okay, this plan's working. I'll try that. So I went that way. And finally, after a few weeks, he said, all right, I got to shoot next week. You want to come help? I can pay you 50 bucks a day. I'm like, Garrett, great, great. I'll do it for free. Even. I don't care. Get to set. It was five days of shooting. We worked, excuse me, 20 hours a day. My knees were swollen by the end of the week because it was a very small crew. And like I said, 50 bucks a day. And it was the time of my life. Like I finally got somewhere. But um, the plan was I didn't know. Like, and that's the thing. If anyone tells you they, they know how to make it, they're, they're lying. Because there is no way. This isn't like being a doctor or a lawyer. If you want to be those things, that path is clear. You go to school for this many years. You, get, you go to do your residency. You intern, da, da, da. Go back to school. You know, you, there is a very defined path. There is no path for filmmaking. You, any way you can get there, you have to go. That means snatching onto every opportunity you've got. At the media, as soon as you find something that it looks like it might be a way through. So that's how it has been for me. Like, you know, oh, an opportunity to work on a film as a PA. I don't care, I'll do it. Like, yes, I, I'm in. Um, that has worked out to be very, very much in my favor. Like even things like fan films, for example. Um, I'm directing a fan film right now that most people kind of poo-poo the idea of fan films, which is kind of crazy to me because fan films is interesting. Uh, when you think about doing a short film, right? If you're trying to practice your craft, well, when you get it done, you gotta talk someone into watching it. Because what good is it if no one sees your work, right? You can get into festivals, and when you play a festival, more than likely, as a short, you'll be crammed into a block of shorts and most of the people in the audience, and this is not being cynical here, this is real reality. When you get shoved into a block of shorts, most people in the audience are the other filmmakers 
who made those other shorts. So it's, it's just a smattering of other people. Like they're only there waiting to watch their, their work, right? You have a term for it, I think. <laughs> it's a something sandwich. <laughs> I probably do, but I'm, I'm blanking on what the okay, term is. It's, it's probably not safe for work. I will, I will, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll fast forward. Yeah, I don't remember what the term is. Anyway, so like, yeah, they're, they're, um, they're all there. So anyway, you got to get people to watch your film, and it's really hard to do. You go, oh, so yeah, you got to watch my short. It's about this time traveler who went back in time, and he meets his grandfather, or whatever, right? Okay, if I have 15 minutes, how long is it? You know, it's <laughs> 25 minutes. Oh, man, i got to find 25 minutes to watch a film. Or you make a fan film, and they go, oh, I made a, I'm making a fan film about Splinter Cell. I love Splinter Cell. You made a fan film over that? Oh, too, I want to check it out. It's... So the name of the game, you gotta remember, is to get people to see what you're doing. Whether you're an actor or a cinematographer, director, it doesn't matter. Writer, you have to get people to see your work. And what's the shortest way to get that to done? You, you gotta look at, that's where the opportunities come in. And fan films have been great for me and for other filmmakers. I mean, look at the guy who directed 10 Cloverfield Lane, made a fan film about the video game Portal. That got him, boom, got him down the road. Uh, there's a guy I've heard who's, working on a big franchise film who made a fan film for Bumblebee. That got him into some doors. Like, it is, uh, there's many, many, many stories about people who did that and then they got to another level. It's gotten me into rooms making fan films. Um, and that's what I mean by the opportunity. Like, at first, you know, if you judge it, be careful. Take a serious look at what opportunity this might be and snatch onto it and grab your way forward. It's... Uh, it's how I've made my whole living and made my life. So even though Hollywood maybe was considered like, you know, the, the gateway to bad things, I see though that like the work ethic is what is what propelled you. So even though yeah. it was forbidden, you still have that work ethic in you. Yeah, Something yeah. It was a good combination in some It sense. did, yeah. And you know, you're in an industry where there is all kinds of unscrupulous people. Like, this, yeah, ask anyone. They've had some sort of bad experience with film and getting screwed over by anyone. Uh, so when you work with integrity, that means a lot. This is why people, you, when you watch, it's like Martin Scorsese, for example, he always hires the same people. Same, that's because integrity can be rare. So when you find the people that are integrity and talented, you hang on to them with everything you've got and you fight to get them on all your projects because you know that they're good people that will deliver. Yeah, that's, that's really valuable. That's better than any demo reel. That's better than your fancy website, integrity, people knowing that you're gonna do what you say you will do, delivering it on time. That's very important. And, and you know, read any business book, they'll tell you the same thing. Can you take us to the day that you went to the Close Encounters of a Third Kind? And like, what, what happened? Where was the theater? What was that like for you, seeing it? I feel like seeing Close Encounters, I think it was a drive through I think it was, and... In Oregon? Yeah, up in Oregon. My, I'm out with my dad and my brother, and I could not believe what I was seeing. There was just this sense of magic. The way Spielberg, especially the golden age of Spielberg, captures an image like, I'll never forget the scene when the boy was missing. Yeah, he had crawled out, he's missing. And, she, and the mom is looking for him and she's walking through the woods with the flashlight beam sweeping around this foggy woods. It was so like, and, the, and, that, and that, that in the scene of the uh, UFOs, when they're running down the road and the police are chasing him and then uh, Richard Dreyfus is in his truck and he's they're all together chasing him down the road. Like that image really burned into my mind, especially when they went off the hill and then the other cars followed. I don't know if you remember, but they follow and they fly off the cliff. But I do, it, but even as a young age, what really struck me was Spielberg as a way of milking a moment. He doesn't just... Here's my theory is, reaction is more important than action, right? So let's say you have a movie about UFOs. Well, I think the temptation is just to show the UFO, but what's really, what Spielberg is the master at is showing the reaction to the UFO. So remember the scene where 
Dreyfus is sitting in his truck and he's lost. He's got his map. And he's like trying to figure out and you see behind him, the lights go up. Oh, that is such a great image. The lights go, they don't go around, they go up and he builds you to it because a few people pass him prior and that one goes up. Well, the first thing you see is he hears a sound. He looks around and he shines the light out the window and you see the mailbox is going crazy and then the, the um, railroad sign goes back and forth. Oh, that made such a huge impression on me. And then his car shuts off then the light goes on. You don't even see the UFO for a long, long time. It's all his reaction to what's going on. And then the light comes on and that whole ordeal, then we see it and he gets sunburnt. After it leaves, there's this really cool beat of Richard Dreyfuss just like trembling. I was hooked. Boom. I get emotional right now just thinking about like how powerful that image was. Like, and again, this is, this is the day, back in the day, there wasn't VHS at that time. There was no way to watch it on YouTube. There wasn't a YouTube. Um, and I didn't know if I could see it again because I was, movies were considered tools of the devil in my household. So going to the theater was not a good thing for me. So I had to go home and really just absorb the film. That really uh, affected me a lot as well. You know, being forced to use my mind to like, you know, marinate on every single shot and frame and image. And I wanted to do it so I could retell it to my friends and try to, I remember as a kid, like trying to explain to them and, and make them feel the way I felt when I watched it. Like, oh yeah, so the, one of the UFOs was like a diamond, but the, the last one was a dot, a little like <laughs> swirling. You know, it's just funny. My, I remember my friends kind of rolling their eyes at my description, but especially when I would sing the score. <laughs> well, if, 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 I, if this memory serves me, wasn't with Steven Spielberg that, that he had a fascination, especially with E.T., and maybe the story, I'm just imagining it, but that he went to camp and he was sick, and these kids supposedly saw an extra, uh, extraterrestrial. Oh, really? And forgive me, this, this could be, well, someone will correct me in the comments, I'm sure, but, and then, so that was forbidden to him because he missed it, if the, if the story is correct. Oh. So he wasn't able to see this alleged extraterrestrial because he was sick. So that's got him thinking about space and everything. And I had not heard that story. Could have imagined this, but I thought this was a news story back in the day. So when I heard that, to me, I was intrigued by that. And, and this like little being that was like so human-like, mm -hmm. but wasn't really from here and wasn't part of us, but seemed like it was part of us only better. It yeah. was a better being than most humans. Isn't it interesting that that him not seeing the thing he most wanted is what drove him to create so many wonderful things. Right. I think that's true for, I know like it's true for a lot of us. Like for me, like movies were denied me. Sure. Which made me want it more. Right. Made me fight for it. Like it, it created in me a tenacity that in a way I'm kind of glad that it did happen that way because it created this drive that I don't know, you can't train that. You don't get drive from film school. You that know? is true. You, it comes from within you or you don't, or you have to find, <laughs> come up with it on your own. Um, I, I'm sure it's the same for Spielberg. He had to make that, he had to see his alien for himself. How else is he gonna do it but write one and direct one, you know, make, you know, I, I don't know, there's something to be said for that. The harder the struggle, the more sweet the reward when you get it. I think, you know, I think and hard work and things being difficult is a good, good thing. Like, this is why we do things like climb mountains and run races, because if it's really hard and you get to the top, it's so great. Like, the work is fun and pushes you. I think it's a good thing. Like, we, we say, we fantasize about it all being easy, but... Is that really what you want? Because, you know, think about the best films ever made. So many, like Jaws. Look at Jaws. We keep talking about Spielberg, but mm -hmm. how hard that was to make. So many of the struggles that they had on making of Jaws, like the shark didn't work, is the things that make the movie great. The fact that you never see a shark because it didn't work. <laughs> but it was through the struggle that that was born. Um, yeah, struggle is a good thing. Good thing. How many years did you make a living as a filmmaker outside of Los Angeles? Uh, probably about 20, close to 20. Yeah, it was a long, long road. Um, and honestly, 
you know, moving to LA, that's the Super Bowl. And that's the, there's a question. Of, I wanted to move here, but I was terrified. Because it is, this is where the big boys go. And if you're not living here, you always have the excuse of like, I could have made it if I, I could have done that. But if you don't live here, you can just keep using that excuse. So it, it's rubber meets the road time. I, do you have what it takes to make it or not? Uh, so it's scary. Plus I still had those childhood baggage of like, oh, it's the lion's den, it's the big city. So it, I avoided it for a long time. Um, but I think it was, it was a very good thing not to live here because it forced me to do a lot more uh, other things. When you're in LA, if you don't live here, um, LA is so big and there's so many filmmakers doing the job that, that the jobs become very specific. Like I know cinematographers who, who shoot commercials and they end up being the guy that, like I knew a guy who spent several years just being the guy shooting things on tabletops, like products on tabletops. And that was it. That's all he would do. And he gets stuck in that little job. Like when I tell people and I'm in, a, in LA, when I tell them I'm a director, they say, well, what are you a director of? I'm like, well, I mean, I direct features and commercials and music videos. And, yeah, no, but when you direct features, is it action or comedy? Like they want you to be very hyper specific in what you do. That's, it's very strange to get used to that idea because there's so many people and so much competition you know they want you to be like a, a guy the other day told me it's a stay in your lane mentality we're in this lane to stay in your lane don't don't move over how dare you you know um, when you don't live here you you have to do whatever you got to do to survive you know you got to like work music video one day and it's a feature the next or it's a training film or whatever um, uh, I totally lost my train of thought I don't know where I was going with it, but, but yeah so you lived tw or 20 years outside of LA making a living as a filmmaker, mm -hmm. but you were also able to make your own projects as well, yeah. right? And do you think that would have been possible had you been here with the cost of living and, and all of the fun things to yeah. do here and distractions? That's a great question. So first couple of films I made, so, oh man, making films is so hard to do. So. You know, and I'm saying this besides the, the, the make a living jobs, you know, the corporate commercials. Stuff. Feature films, it's a whole other deal. So you have two options when it comes to feature films. You're either making independent ones or you're making ones in a studio system. So if you don't live here, you have to do them independent. And I don't know if I could have um, done it living here. Most people I know who live here, who went, who've lived here 20 years, have never done it. Like it's very hard to get through because you are fighting a giant system, like a massive corporations and people are groomed and brought up and your, your competition is people who, whose fathers and grandfathers were in the industry. Like you're, that's the rat race that you're in when you're here. If you're not here, the thing, what you're fighting for is finding investors or supporters for your film. And it's in a way, in a big way, it's a lot easier to make a feature not living in LA. In fact, the feature I just shot this year, we didn't shoot it in LA because it was too expensive. So we went to Washington State to do it hmm. because simply the studio cost in LA was $65,000. In Washington State, it was eight. Oh, wow. So, you know, when you're dealing with a small budget on an independent film, that's a huge amount of money that you can use for a lot of other things. So I don't think I would have been able to do it if I lived here. But there's always the unknown, you know, the question, hmm, would I have? Like, maybe. Uh, I think not living here helped me. But I will say that knowing that if you don't live in LA, depending on whatever your goal is, there is a glass ceiling. It's only so high you can do, get. If you live in wherever, Seattle or wherever, the top you're gonna get to is you know internal videos for Microsoft and Amazon. If you live in Portland, it was Nike and Intel. Right? There's no shame in that. That's fine. That's a great living, and you can sure. work the rest of your life doing that kind of stuff. Um, but that's that's it. Unless you get some independent film going, that's that's about all you can expect. They're not going to hire a director 
even if they're shooting their TV show in your town, and that, I've experienced that. Big production comes to town, they're not gonna hire that director locally. They're gonna hire that from LA. You have to go to LA if you wanna work in that industry, if you wanna work on that upper echelon of work. Um, and sorry, the feature that, sorry to interrupt, the feature you just shot in Washington State, yeah. did you hire local crew or you had LA people come up? Both. So I hired like the department heads, some of the department heads here, cinematographer, the producers were all from here, the cast was all from here. Once we got up there, we hired, you know, the, crewed up the rest, got our gaffer and our ACs and all, all the other crew members. And that's typically how it works. Even in cities, the hub cities like New Mexico and Atlanta, you know, they're, they're not gonna hire the directors out of there unless they're established. They're gonna get, they're, you can crew up there all day long, but. And the 65,000 versus the eight, mm -hmm. do you have a rough estimate of what was the difference? Like why it was so expensive mm -hmm. here? Well, LA is just a very expensive place to live. That's part of it. Um, so you're paying per diem or you're different or just no, living? No, that was purely the building rental ah, without anything else. The building rental, okay. Just to get into a building that was large enough for us to use, you know, soundproofed and all of that, that's how much it cost. That's no gear rental, not utilities, nothing. And that was where the soldier was in this like panic room. Correct. Type thing. Yeah. Okay, right, which was very cool. And we'll yeah. put a link to that. Yeah, Hopefully so that... yeah. We had to build a set that was movable and we could right. shift it around because mm -hmm. the film was about anti-gravity anti and stuff and we had to do a lot of camera tricks. We needed a large space. Actually, the place we found was twice as big as what we needed. We didn't even use half the building for, yeah, for, I don't know, a tenth the cost or something like that. What about insurance, the difference? In insurance is about the same. Oh, is it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's roughly the same for production. Crew was, well, we didn't have a big budget. They, they can be roughly the same, but yeah, what a camera rental, you could, we got good deals on. Equipment rental, we got great deals on, better than you could get in LA. Um, but yeah, it's just because it's so expensive to live in LA. That's why all the productions, so many have left. That's why they go to Vancouver. That's why they go to these other places because it's just expensive, which is unfortunate. When you were up there dealing with any crew or I know you said most of the cast was from LA, but mm -hmm. did they have a desire to come down here or were they happy working? Uh, you know, I think everyone either secretly wants to come to LA or they've been and they've left because they didn't like it or something. I, I, Because everybody wants to work in the big leagues, I think. But there's also this funny, um, I, I don't need to live in LA kind of thing. So um, there were some that definitely wanted to, but I think a lot are afraid or they have children and they don't want to raise them here, which is a legitimate concern, you know? Um, or strong family ties. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, or, I mean, Friends I'm speaking school. from a Northwest boy. Like I love I mean, the Northwest is beautiful. The weather's incredible. You got mountains and, and all that up there. It's very hard to leave that. My family's all up there. It's very hard to leave that. Very hard. Like come down here. It's a lot of concrete. It's a lot of people. There's traffic and there's smog. It's, you know, it's, that's hard, you know, and you may not work. So that's tough to sacrifice, you know, sacrifice all of that for something that may never happen. Um, that's what you're looking at. That's the reality. So yeah, I mean, a lot of them, I think, want to do that, but may never just because they don't want to make that sacrifice. But then there's two schools of thought because there's that leaving the nest and all the friends and family and everything going somewhere unknown. Maybe it's a little bit colder in mentality. Maybe it isn't. Or you stay back and you think of, you know, woulda, coulda, shoulda type thing. At what point did you say, I have to try it? I can't yeah. be that person in the cubicle going, well, what would happen if I was in LA right. right now? Man, that's a to when did I make that? I, I, you know, my wife and I talked about it a lot for years. We've actually debate constantly about, oh, you should have moved here then. Um, I did make the decision, I would say I made the decision to come here maybe seven or eight years ago, but I couldn't get here then. Like financially, because the reality is, is you have to like, it's going to cost you without even breaking a sweat. You're going to drop five, 10,000 bucks, first and last month's rent, moving truck, all the, just the moving expenses. And then rent is more than likely going to be a couple grand a month and you have to be working immediately, 
Like you got to either your spouse needs a job or you need a job full time. That's if you're 20, that's much easier to do. You can couch surf and whatever. If you have a family, in my case, I don't have children, but I have a wife. We had pets. I had a I had an office space for my business. Like, how am I going to move all that? I have to. I can't just live in a one bedroom place. I have to, and I have no more clients. So it was really tough. It took me a long, long. I had to take a job to come down here. Like I worked a job for a year and a half to like when I first landed. It was the only way I could make it work. So the desire was there for a while. But I just could not figure out how to bridge that gap. Um, that was hard, really tough sacrifice. Um, and that, I think that will test you on how much you want it. How bad? Because most people who live here have had to do that. Maybe you know how many of my friends have lived in their cars down here. You probably know lots who had to like. Went for a stint because they just couldn't afford to an apartment. I mean, that everyone has to go through that gauntlet. To you know, they, there is a lull, and then you come back out of it. But most people don't want to make that sacrifice, or they're afraid to, or they can't, like for some reason, um, and they, so they just don't. So, yeah, it's. Um, and I also want to say though, it does, it, I don't want to put any judgment on people who don't live here. Because I think a lot of this comes down to what you want. What do you want to do? Like, there is no shame at all in living in another city, working corporate videos or wedding videos or whatever it is. There's no shame in that at all. Like, it's it just depends on what you want to do. If you're comfortable in that world and that's what you like, then great, good for you. That's great, and you can make your independent films and get them off the ground. If you want to work and direct. Write, direct, or produce. You want to be in the uh, above the line kind of crew on bigger films. You got to live. You just have to live here because it's who you know. That's where they hired these people from. Um, yeah. And sometimes being here, there's there's this um, thing of well, oh, if it's not all A list or it's not this, then it's not worth doing. And there's a judgment, and sometimes I find the judgment comes from people that aren't even in that realm, <laughs> but yeah. they think that somehow they're going to hop to that realm. Have you yeah. faced any criticism in terms of because you are making your living? I'm assuming doing corporate videos, which there's still a sense of creativity. You're yeah, still, there's you're still doing something. That there's a sense of play. I'm sure, I know you have to have the client approve right. everything, and some clients are probably easier than others. But yeah, how well, have you dealt with that? Well, so first of all, I'd say like I, I do a lot of commercial corporate, but that's not all. You know, I do features as well. Like I do make a living doing all of that stuff. Oh, okay. It's kind of spread out. Um, each day is different, literally. And yeah, there's a weird unspoken judgment about anything that's not that upper tier or feature work or television work. It's weird. It's almost like the work that's not that is not legitimate, which I think is ridiculous. You look at anyone who's made it. Any, any person you respect, all of them got their start doing. Robert Altman did corporate video, training films, and he used that in his career, you know, when he was directing big movies. Uh, Wally Pfister, the DP for uh, Christopher Nolan, he started doing news. Roger Deakins did documentaries. All of those guys, whenever you read interviews with them, they often refer to those times before. The skills they learned while they were doing those jobs. There is no shame in that. Like it is important training ground. And if you can do some stuff in that realm, you're getting to practice on a level that if you fail, it's okay. I'd much rather work out the kinks on working with an actor on a corporate video versus when I'm directing for Warner Brothers. I would way rather figure it out back then before I get up there. Then I'm at least seasoned and I know what I'm talking about when I get there. So yeah, it's really, and I never understood that. And you're right, it often comes from people who, who aren't even work, working up there anyway. But what I have noticed is that <clears throat> even, you know, like I said, I've been able to carve out a niche doing dramatic storytelling for corporations and things like that. Often the people I've met in, in the industry in LA are kind of like, they, they, I've heard many times, I've never seen anyone do this before. I've never, I'm not even directing as much as you are. And I'm not saying that to be arrogant. I'm just saying it's there. I think most people are missing this enormous opportunity to practice and get paid to practice. And again, it comes from this positive thing. I'm going to choose 
to use this as a positive and get it to get me where I need to go because those things will get you in those doors, I think, um, because it, I mean, half the stuff on my reel is corporate. But it you also look like it. But <laughs> yeah. No, right. I mean, you have and you have a, a beautiful use of color too. Oh, thank it you. Seems like you you really focus on on using just interesting color palettes. Why have you made storytelling the focus of your life? Well, you know, Plato said, he who tells the stories rules society. Um, and, you know, there's, there's power in storytelling. Think about storytelling and how much of it is in our lives. You know, we, when we get together, we want to hear about what have you been up to? Like, you know, you're asking, tell me the story about your life. Uh, I, you know, my wife and I, like people, how did you guys meet? When you hear the story, right? We tell stories to our kids to put them to sleep at night. It's comforting. And I've heard it said that um, in this day and age, we have access to more stories than it ever before in human history. We, that's what we do for fun. We go see a movie, a story. We watch television. It's, it's, it is so permeated in our society. Um, it, there's, it's amazing. It's great. And it's such a powerful tool. Like a lot of the, I mean, for, use Christianity, for example, like Jesus, not to get religious on you, but Jesus talked in parables. He used storytelling as a way to teach. It's a powerful method. And the things that he talked about then are still debated today, right? So I love that power of storytelling, not in a um, power-hungry, drunk kind of way, but just it's just a great, beautiful way to like work. Uh, and it's, it's, this is what I find interesting. Um, when people say in a job interview, you're looking for a job, uh, what do we do? Like we wanna tell, we wanna talk to people and give them our story about our background and whatever we do, but then what do we do? We hand them a resume that is a list of bullet points about facts, the most unmemorable thing you can imagine. I don't care how powerful your bullet points are, if it's not wrapped in a story, you won't remember it. Um, so I love that, I, and I try to bring that with me no matter what kind of film I'm working on. Um, and there is nothing that beats the feeling of moving someone or getting their, them to think about things in a different way. That's, that's what art does, right? Paint, whether it's a painting or a piece of music, it can move you and change you and oftentimes challenge you into, I never thought about, you know, person that way or whatever it is, wrap that in a story. Oh man, it's just incredible what it can do. Uh, a really negative example of this is, you know, the remember the movie Birth of a Nation back in oh, what are the 30s or what, whenever that came out. Um, the Birth of, a, Birth of a Nation movie was about um, African-American um, senators, like they showed them as evil people, right? Doing evil things. And the Ku Klux Klan, being the heroes of the story. This is where the Burning Cross came from. That, oh. that imagery came from that movie. Wow. So the Ku Klux Klan got them out and took down the terrible villains, and they were the heroes. Well, at the time that movie came out, the Ku Klux Klan were almost non-existent. But once that movie came out, oh, wow. it exploded to several million. That was all based on the power of a story in a negative way. Um, you know, you look at I mean, like Top Gun, when that movie came out, the, right. the um, application rate for the Air Force skyrocketed. Uh, what was that? Castaway. Huge, oh. all of a sudden FedEx, boom. All because of a story, a powerful story. Um, I, that is so fascinating to me. And here's the funny thing about story is that we all know when we hear a good one, you know, we... We see a movie, we instantly know if we like it or not, but it's very hard for us to know how to tell one. And the, the skills to learn how to tell a story take a lifetime to learn, like understanding what does a protagonist do? You know, what should he do or not do, you know, in a story? Like those are hard, much harder to learn because the audience, everyone's a cynic, which you probably see in the comments. <laughs> You, you said that, that one, one thing to make a, an effective hero is make them really good at their job. Yes. And, and hadn't really thought of that before. Yeah. And so even if it's an anti-hero, they're really good at their job, and uh -huh. that's very true. Yeah, and see how much fun, you know, like look at Breaking Bad. He's an anti-hero. Sure. But man, we love it when he's making math. 
and he's outsmarting people. Yeah. And kind of, you know, even even the scene where he confronts the bullies in the store in the thrift shop or mm -hmm. whatever where he is. I like teams. when he's te there are moments in that <laughs> that series when he's teaching science to the students. And I remember there's one scene where he's got three um, bottles, and as he squirted a flame, the flame changed color, all based on the solution that was inside. It was really cool to see him so skilled. He's a super flawed human. Sure. Uh, there's a character on that show, Mike, who's really good at his job too. Uh, if you've ever watched the show, but I mean, James Bond, like, guy's great at, you know, he's got flaws, but he's, man, it's fun. Jason Bourne, really good at fighting people. Man, it's so cool to watch. He just, you know, he just really get into it when they start doing that. So yeah, then you can, and you want to, you know, tease your audience with that. You, you want to let them enjoy that a little bit. I mean, that's superhero movies. Look at it, like, you can make them as flawed as you want, but you have to show them being, you know, you want to see Batman, be Batman, and beat some people up and fly and do what he does. Um, that's important. That's part of the allure. And even in E.T., although Elliot didn't have a job, mm -hmm. he was great at sort of being this, he, you know, he had this sort of symbiotic relationship with this yeah. creature and, right. and he led, you know, his group of friends on their bike and stuff. So he was good at sort of rounding the troops and, and trying to get him back. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it doesn't, yeah, job, be good at job or whatever they do. You want them to be good, like, try to think it like uh, Stranger Things. Um, there's a, in the latest season of Stranger Things, there's a girl that works in the ice cream shop who's just really good at solving mysteries, which makes it fun to watch, you, to see her solve, because I think they solve a, they figure out a Russian a broadcast. They kind of put it, the pieces together and you watch and her like do it. It's just, it make, it just, you just love to watch somebody smart doing something that they're good at. Like it's enjoyable, draws you in. Or good will hunting. Yes. It, although maybe, okay, he wasn't, the best janitor, maybe he was, but he was solving, he was secretly he solving that. these math problems. Yeah, he saw that math problem. It's yeah. cool. He just, oh man, that's awesome. Yeah, that's, that's really, it's one thing that makes you care about them. Yeah, it's important. Does the antagonist have to be the strongest character in a movie? Hmm, well, that, ooh. Strongest versus not strongest. I would say they need to be at least as well defined as your hero. Um, I don't know. I, I think they need to be one of the strongest, if not the strongest. Like the hero and the antagonist probably, I would say neck and neck as far as well-defined. Like oftentimes the antagonist is not well-defined. They're just a villain. Uh, I've heard it described bad villains as muahaha villains, <laughs> where it's just, they're just evil for the sake of being evil. And that is the most uninteresting villain you could create. Just a bad guy doing evil, ha -ha, laughing as he beats up somebody. Like. Come on, you know, that's what's more terrifying. Uh, like for example, I think um, this may be a terrible example, but in The Force Awakens, you've got Kylo Ren, you know, the son of Han Solo, right? He's, he's essentially sort of a villain, probably an anti-hero slash villain. He's a, he's a complicated character. But to me, I found him really terrifying because he's, he's like a child with a lot of power. That to me is scary. He wants to be loved. No one's loved him before. That's the impression I got from him as a character. But he can, boy, he can stop a bullet. And it really makes you afraid of him because he's so well developed. Like everyone can identify with that sense of wanting to be loved. Um, I think we've all been in the presence of someone with a lot of power and you don't know if they're gonna snap at you and, and do something dangerous. Like that, man, that's way, way more interesting than someone who's just evil for the sake of being evil. I mean, actually, a perfect example, the, the guy that is his rival in the movie, the uh, Brandon Glazer's son, uh, the redhead guy who plays his, he's their same, same age, I'm blanking on his name. Um, Gleason. Gleason uh, plays the other character. He is a little bit more like evil for the sake of being evil. He doesn't really have the backstory Kylo Ren has, right? So it makes Kylo Ren way more memorable in that film. And you've talked about the backstory in The Wound, and you compared several films and said that all of them were orphans. Yeah. That's an interesting thing. Batman, Spider-Man, uh, Harry Potter, James Bond, um, Luke Skywalker. Uh, yeah, the fact that those are all orphans is not an accident. That, that's on purpose. That's because the idea of not having parents is like, 
we can all identify with what, what that might be like. Um, giving your hero a wound, that's another way to get them to care about, us to care about them. I mean, orphan is one way, but like, I mean, look at Jason Bourne. His wound is amnesia. That makes you really go, oh man, that'd be, that's, that sucks, you know? That's, that's a great, you know, you make them great at what they do and some sort of wound that they're dealing with is, is too powerful narrative um, things to do. And Matt Damon in Good Will Hunting, I believe oh, he didn't yeah. have parents either. Yeah. That's right, he right. Another orphan. Yeah. Parents. And you know, his wound is from the foster system. His wound is this mental anguish that he carries with him. So yeah, absolutely. It makes you want you want him to learn to love so bad in that movie. It's oh, it's yeah, it's a such a brilliantly written film. Yeah, it's well drawn character. When writing, do you start with an outline? Uh, sometimes. Um, I like to know where I'm going at least, at a very minimum. I like to, it's hard for me to write without an end goal, even if it's the end of a scene or the next scene. Um, if I'm writing like a feature length screenplay from beginning, I'll generally lean towards an outline. Yeah, at least so I'll know some of the beats. A lot of the writing I've done is for just all different kinds of things, like, you know, shorter form things or whatever. and. That could be a different process, but um, yeah, I'd say generally an outline is good just to help me keep pace and track of where I'm going. So otherwise, it, scenes can meander anyway, especially when your characters start taking on a life of their own. Like you'll, it's really strange, but they will start to talk and your story will meander. And I think it's good to have at least those checkpoints. That said, I think I have to be flexible enough to let them go away from those checkpoints. Because sometimes it just doesn't, you feel that the characters want to go over here and my milepost is over there. And that'll force you to take a step back and, hmm, this isn't working. Maybe I shouldn't, but that's good. And so that, you know, the outline does help in those instances to like make you re-examine your story. So yeah, I, I would guess the answer would be yes. The outline is, is good for me personally. How do you outline? Like if you were to explain it to someone who had never done an outline before, mm -hmm. how would you show them? Yeah, I would, um, I'll outline a couple of different ways. I'll, I'll, I wanna know how it ends. So a lot of times I'll start at the very, very end of my story. Um, and not only the plot, but I wanna know the theme. So like, what am I trying to say with this story? This is a story about parenting or whatever, whatever it is. Um, so it's, it's almost like a parallel outline, right? I want to say this by the end. Even though Stephen King says you can't do that, you know, Stephen King in his book on writing says uh, you can't write with the moral of the story in mind. Uh, something like, I'm butchering that quote, but he says something along those lines. Um, I personally like doing that because I like to have something to say. So if I were teaching someone how to do it, um, I would say, yeah, you need to know like where it ends. You need to know where the big turning points are. Um, start with the big overarching stuff first. Uh, at what point does your story get going? You know, like we meet your character, but you've got to have that moment where it pivots and he goes in this direction or life forces him into a certain direction. You know, you need, you, you should know that. You don't just like stumble across it. Um, that should be thought out. Um, I like to know where the halfway point is, point of no return. You know, that's where the, you know, in Apollo 13, where they decide, oh, we have to slingshot around the moon to get back to the earth. There's that point where they have to keep going and not go back. I like to know where that is. I think it's important. Um, we hear characters cross that line, they have to journey forward. Um, if you're following any of those traditional storytelling techniques, like the hero's journey, for example, those are really important beats to understand. You know, the, the world building or the um, ordinary world stage, for example, that's the, like I say in Finding Nemo, the ordinary world stage is seeing what his life is like as an ordinary person. Um, then there's uh, the call to action stage. In Star Wars, the call to action is Obi-Wan saying, you should come and join the rebellion. Then there's a refusal of the call. You know, those are, those are big bullet points that I think is important to understand. Luke says, no, I can't go join the rebellion. I gotta farm, I gotta help out with the farm. And then they, they end up crossing the threshold. That's, you know, crossing the threshold, I believe is another one of those beat points. So it is important, I think, to know that. 
Now, that's not to say that every story has to follow those. You know, rules are made to be broken, but I do think there does need to be certain things that you know ahead of time. Um, that, yeah, that will make your story stronger. Uh, and, you'll, and that will translate to you on set. You'll know, if you know those bullet points when you start, you'll know, okay, this scene right here is the moment where he's saying the thing he's always wanted to say. This is the turning point. And actors love to know that kind of thing, right? So that outline really will help underscore everything. I might have heard you say this in one of your YouTube videos you made, that a filmmaker should not be finishing their script while still yeah. on set. Yeah, and I know that, and I'll say that, yeah, that you should at least know what it's about. I, now, I know that these things happen on set. They even happen to me where you'll, you'll be in the middle of a scene and go, oh, wait, this doesn't work. And sometimes those things, that's not what I was referring to. Sure, like, sure. Um, and the reason why is, especially if you're working in independent film, I don't know, you should be doing this all the time, but when you're doing indie film or a short film or whatever, you are going to be spending a lot of money that's probably either yours on your credit card or someone's money that you borrowed. You're gonna be asking a lot of favors. A lot of people are gonna be out there for you to make your project happen. And if you are not doing the due diligence to make sure that script is solid before you get there, then what are you doing? Like that, I, that is the thing that, gets under my skin so quick when I'm watching someone's film and I can clearly see that they have not thought their story through before they filmed it. This happened way back when I first got into the business, I remember watching a friend's film and they'd done the exact same thing. They worked with, they got deals from the camera house. They had all these actors come out for free. They even had a couple of name actors in it. And it was so bad. The story was terrible. And we were all kind of sitting in stunned silence at the end of the film and they were up there in this Q and A and the friend of mine that was with me, he said, he asked them like, is there any regrets that you have about the film, anything you do differently? And one of the, the writers said, yeah, I'd probably know who the bad guy was before we started shooting. And I'm like, how does, how do you, how does this happen to not know that? And this is my theory. Filmmaking is like sex. It's exciting and it's the thing that everybody wants to run and do, right? We all want to just rush into it because it's just so much fun to have sex. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, you know, because, yeah, it's exciting to yell action and cut. And we're all there and we're creating this thing together. But you know what's even better is to romance it a little bit to get to know it a little bit. Let's, let's get to know my hero a little bit. Would he say this? Would he not say this? Would she react in this kind of way? Take some time, get to know each other, build up this relationship a little bit. And then when you get to the set, it's way more sexy and exciting because you know you're creating something special. As opposed to like, oh, I don't know this kind of, I don't know why he's saying this line. I guess I'll just, you gotta have that script done. And I get it, it's not sexy to sit there by yourself in your underwear and type this thing. <laughs> to get someone to, to critique it and rip it apart and go through that humiliation process. That's hard, that, but that's called work. That's the work of filmmaking that a lot of us don't like to do and don't want to do, but you know, you have to. And I'll tell you this, that um, that is the stage, the script writing phase. This is why independent film works because when you're doing indie film, you cannot throw your money at your problems. You know, you can't, you know, ask for a few more days of filming. You don't have a few more days of filming. You have to get it then. But indie films, when you have a story that's great, that was well thought out, good structure, well-rounded characters, you can hang a lot of bad stuff on a great story and it still works. That's independent film. It can be out of focus. It's still great. It still works because the story is there. Sure. You can have bad acting. Right. The story's there. I've forgiven a lot of bad acting, but the story's so compelling, I don't care. So that you cannot fast forward past that part of it. I've seen many independent films that are not shot well. I think we all have, right? They're shot, or independent film, right? They may have been shot on high eight. I don't know. They're still great because the story. I mean, look at, um, here's a great example, is um, 28 Days Later, shot by Danny Boyle, shot on high eight. 
you know, that's that's like a, I mean, he did, they did a great job. They had a great DP, but it's still high eight. It looks like high eight, but the story is so good, you don't care because it's just so well. And, you know, you got great acting in it as well, but this is the engine that makes independent film go. So when you're in a theater or you're watching something, um, whether it's, you know, on TV, how soon into the film can you tell, oh, you know what? They, they were still rewriting <laughs> the script what, while they were already day two of, of the Man. first, you know, incarnation. Sometimes you can tell pretty fast. Sometimes you can tell it really, especially when you'll see, I've seen films even in the opening scene where I can tell that they didn't even think through the dialogue to make it clever or work it very hard where the characters are just saying dumb things. And that's just such a waste. I mean, it's just a waste. Like, it's so hard to make movies. It's so hard to get them going, you know, for all of us. And to just waste everybody's time like that is just a tragedy. Like, I can usually tell pretty quick. Um, sometimes it'll sneak up on you three quarters, of the, usually by halfway, three quarters of the way through, that's when you'll start to go, oh no, they're not going this way with it, are they? Oh, they are, oh. <laughs> it, just, it just breaks your heart. But then it seems like in the reverse, when you know a movie's great, it seems like it gets you from the opening yeah. music or whatever. Like I'm thinking of, is it The in Infiltrator? Did you see that movie with Brian Cranston and Diane no. Kruger? Oh, it's so great. And it was like instantly, I, and, and it doesn't necessarily, I'm not always into to certain films like that, but instantly I knew this was an excellent film and it had me from funny? the opener, from the opening scene. Mm -hmm. Isn't that funny how that works when you have, this is where, like, Christopher Nolan does this, a memento, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Second, I think it was a second film. Like, the opening shot is a Polaroid, right? You see, Got someone curious, takes a yeah. picture of a Polaroid and they hold it up, and the credits are rolling, and the guy's shaking it, and the image is fading. And then you realize as you're watching it, like, wait, this is running in reverse. That, it, which is a theme, for the, is a film about a guy losing his memory. And as he shakes the Polaroid, it's disappearing. Now that's a filmmaker who meticulously thought about every frame and every moment of that film. That's how you make great films. Uh, you know, like, do any of us really want to make just decent films or okay films? We want to make great films, right? We don't want to just like dork around. I don't, I mean, yeah. Sure, it's fun to dork around sometimes, but sure. if you're really doing it and you're spending someone else's money, you have a response. I feel you have a responsibility to your investors, to your crew that are sacrificing themselves to be there, to make it incredible. Make it something that they want to show, and that's how you do it. You think about those little moments, those little nuances. Um, I was on a music video a long time ago where they wanted to show, it was a, it was a Christian music video, it's kind of funny, but they wanted to show a high priest doing the Jewish high priest ritual. Um, and the high priest that they got, I happen to know a little bit about this subject matter because my mom did, you know, high, she, she wanted to, she did taught courses on what the high priests back in the Old Testament days did and what, they, what the garb that they wore. And the thing that they wore is they wore a, a thing called a miter, it was a headpiece that's white. And it's very important that it's white, it symbolizes purity. So they have this actor show up and he's wearing a black headpiece. And I'm like, I'm like horrified. I was just, I'm like in my 20s, but I'm horrified. Like you can't have a, that's so like wrong. Like that color is important. Those were the costume that, and that game is a result of someone not doing their research and meticulously looking at every shot and every frame and you know, all of that stuff. It's important to get it right. Did you say anything? I, I actually did, and the, and the director was like, man, I didn't realize it was that important. Well, yeah, look up in the, you know, you're doing it. This is your subject. You gotta do the research. And I could, you know, if he had just told me two days before, I could have gotten the whole full-on costume there. But no, he, he just, no, oh, I think they just wear what rabbis wear. No, that's a different thing. A rabbi and a high priest from in the Old Testament are two separate things. You know, a rabbi doesn't wear the breastplate like with the tribes of Israel on it but the high priest does you know those are two separate things so he was just getting them confused because of lack of research and lack of preparation like films are made in the prep not on set they're made in the prep when you get to set everything should be smooth sailing and paint by numbers but if you don't 
prep, and that starts with your script, your film will not be strong. And then the other side to it is things do happen where you do several takes with actors, mm -hmm. it doesn't feel right, dialogue's off, something's not right. Yeah. At what point do you think someone should make that call? Like when do you stop? When, when do you stop and say, is it, is it feedback from the actors? Is it, is it something that every, you can just sense it in the room like it's not working and then you say, wait a minute, I think we need to rewrite either a scene oh, yeah. or maybe even half of the That movie. does happen, it does happen. And here's the thing, that's normal. That happens all the time, because you'll have a scene written that sounds great in your mind or you read it even when you're reading it out loud, even in the script reading it, and you'll get to set and go, oh man, why does this feel wrong? Like this feels off. And yeah, I, you know, there, I don't know what the cook time is and when you figure that out, but there had, does happen, it happens a lot where you're, you're looking at it, and it is important, I think, not to power through, but really question, wait a minute, why is he saying this? Why is she asking that question? This doesn't make any sense, because they just asked this in the previous scene. So yeah, I've had to pivot in the moment. Oh, wait a minute, why don't we just go, take this whole line of dialogue out and just go forward? You know, that does happen. And um, again, that's where the prep comes in, because you know those things will happen. You're preparing for that kind of thing to happen. Because if you've prepared it right, and the actors are all on board, and they know, and they've done their prep, uh, you, it'll allow you for those kinds of things to, to adjust. Um, yeah. We talked earlier about the anxiety of this business. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about why it's high anxiety and what can people do to yeah. work with it? Most people I know in this business are full of anxiety. I mean, first of all, if you, most people in film don't have full-time jobs, most people. Um, you know, it goes like this. So there's this financial anxiety, first of all. Uh, you'll have busy seasons. Sprint, summer and fall are often really busy. Winter is usually not. So sometimes you're like, I don't know, I don't know how I'm gonna pay my rent next month. That's very common. Unless you're working, making gobs of money, you're probably fine. But so that's the first off. Second of all is we've all sacrificed so much to be here. Nobody wants to make bad stuff. So when you get these opportunities, you want to do a good job. And you can end up putting so much pressure on yourself that you start screwing things up. That, that's, oh man. Sometimes there's anxiety for the people that you're working with. You know, you get a name talent, for example, an A-lister actor that's coming in and you're so afraid. I think it's afraid of being discovered as a fake or, you know, not talented or whatever. Your worst possible fear, maybe you don't have it. And the actor can see it and, oh no, you know, <laughs> what will happen? Oh man, yeah, anxiety. There, there's the judgments, the egos, you know, someone thinking they're more than they are and they're just, their ego is ruling the set and the anxiety that comes out of that. Um, you're also on film, you know, it's such a collaborative art. All these temperamental artists in a room together on set, you know, sets are pressure cookers. You know, we're all working under tight deadlines and tight financial restrictions. The sun is going down, we gotta get the shot. Um, that's, oh, super anxiety. So. It's something I've definitely struggled with most of my life. I'm a, I can be very high strung. And it's something I really have to pay attention to because anxiety is a killer, you know? It can give you health problems. It, can, it will shut down your creativity. You can work yourself into such a state where you can get panic attacks and things. I've had that happen. Um, like, yeah, it, it's... So I think it's important, first of all, you know, I practice a lot of, you know, self-awareness and meditation and things like that just to help me deal with a lot of those issues. And, you know, not, that's a big rabbit hole, but I will tell you that one thing that's helped me a lot is there are two ways to look at anxiety. So your mind is like this freeway, with cars racing back and forth on it. And, you know, <laughs> money's flying out the door. And, <laughs> oh, this actor's coming, I'm so scared. You know, it's going back and forth. Well, you have a couple of options. You can either stand in the middle of traffic and try to slow the cars down and stop being so anxious and fight it. Or you can sit on the overpass while the traffic's going under you and go, okay, there's a lot of anxiety happening right now. Okay. And don't judge it and let it be and just acknowledge that it's there. And sometimes it'll start to move away. You know, you're not trying to stop the traffic. You're not trying to be angry at the traffic. 
because that doesn't help. You're not trying to, you know, you're just acknowledging that it exists without any judgment. And I also think it's important to not say, I try to avoid the words, I am anxious. It's the same way of saying, I am depressed. Well, I am not the emotion of anxiety. I am Jason, a person with strengths and weaknesses. I am not anxiety. I am not anxious. I am feeling this way right now, but um, not ident- cause we, I think we all have a tendency to do that. I am a pessimist. Well, you're, you're, you're labeling yourself with a certain emotion and that can, I think that can carry a weight. So I think those kinds of self-awareness techniques are really important, especially for filmmakers who are in such a high stress industry. Um, and you know, taking time to laugh at yourself and realize how silly this business is sometimes. And like, I was shooting a thing earlier this year. It was the feature I just did where we were, um, we had to shoot some anti-gravity stuff and we had the camera on a thing called a Lambda head. So you go left and right. And it was very much like Star Trek where the, you know, the, all the actors had to throw themselves one direction while we rolled the camera the other way. And so in, in the monitor, it looks like everything's tilting and the actors are going, whoa, whoa. <laughs> And I'm, you know, it was an intense scene and I'm looking at it and I just start laughing because of how silly it all is. Like how silly this whole make-believe industry is. Like, and I think that's healthy, you know, to like, oh my goodness, look what we're making. This is so dumb what we're doing. And so funny and fun and all of that all together and just laughing at yourself for a minute, you know? Um, and just you know, letting some of that anxiety go and just, cause it's not helping you, it's not serving you, it's not making you more creative, it's not making you more meticulous or anything. It's just making you anxious. Yeah, another thing too is that th- decisions change very quickly in this mm-hmm. industry in so many ways. And all of a sudden like, oh, you know, I'm so sorry, we don't need you. And yeah. you don't know why, you'll yeah. never be told why. So knowing that that could happen and to not, even though you really want something, but to know that you could get that email or that phone call, really sorry, yeah, it's mm-hmm. not gonna happen. Happens all the time. And, and to just, all right, be depressed for like a day and then move on. You know? Yeah, and I think it's important to, to say that it's anxiety, and especially when it results from things like that or depression or discouragement, it's okay. It's okay to be a little frustrated when you get the rejection. That's all right, don't dwell on it. Let yourself feel it and then, you know, give yourself a day or two and then try to move past it. Like, but don't judge the fact that you're a little bit down because you entered the festival that you wanted and they didn't accept you. Yeah, it sucks. We all do it. We're not, no one's different. No one's different. We're all the right. same. And it's just, it's okay to feel that way. But then just give yourself a chance to take a breath, fight again another day. Um, because it is normal. This business is so uncertain. You know how many investors I've talked to over the years trying to get a movie out? Oh man, the amount of times they pulled out. It's maddening sometimes. Close to the shooting date? Oh, sure. Yeah, it happens all the, DPs pull out, actors pull out, projects fall apart. And that's, that ranges from feature films to any, any manner of film job, you know, Shoot, I had, a, I had like three or four weeks of work booked on, on 2001, September 11. You know, I was supposed to go to Egypt for a couple of weeks. I'm a nice, great, big, fat job. And I was going to leave on September 14. And I watched those towers fall and my work stopped dead. That was depressing. That was hard. But normal. It's what happens. This is the business that we fought to be in. So, you know. Try to enjoy it as often as you can because <laughs> it's fun when, it, when it's working. It's great. Sure. It's great. What's the most unprepared you've ever been as a director and what did that teach you? Oh, man. Okay, let me think. When was I? When, I feel, you know what? I honestly feel unprepared a lot. Uh, and that drives me to, <laughs> to be more prepared. Um, it is the worst feeling in the world to show up, it doesn't even have to be on set. It could be at a client meeting or a production meeting where you realize you haven't done your due diligence. Um, I remember this was a a client job, a commercial project where I ended up showing up late to the meeting 
when everyone was on time but me because I didn't plan right and I didn't have the concept fully thought through and I was saying things in the meeting about the project that they wanted to do. You know, like we want to advertise this XYZ product and I had not researched it. It's embarrassing. You're scrambling. You're hoping to God they don't realize that you're unprepared. It, it's the worst, worst feeling in the world. Um, what did it teach me? It taught me that I know that there is sometimes a resistance to pre preparation. I don't know where this resistance comes from, but sometimes there is. Oh man, I mean, sometimes it feels like work. It's not the sexy part, re research. I am not even a natural researcher. Let's say it's, let's say it's a movie about um, a court case, criminal trial. Let's say you have a, a courtroom drama. Well, I don't know that much about the legal system, but it would behoove me to research it if I'm doing a movie on it. Because the more I know about how courts work and how lawyers do their jobs and all that kind of thing, the better off I'm gonna be on my feet. Um, but that's not sexy. That's not fun. That's not working with an actor, working out a character. It's, oh man, it feels hard. Um, honestly, doing commercial and corporate work has really helped prepare me for that kind of thing because it makes me have to dig into things I didn't think I'd ever want to dig into, you know, and being on time. There's no, that's so frustrating for everybody else when they are showing up before the director. Like they're there. Because what you know what that says? That they're more into this than you are. You don't want to be in that position. You don't want your crew going, dude, it's 20, you were supposed to meet 20 minutes. That's, that's not good. That's not a way to inspire trust with your team um, or preparedness. Yeah, that, so I've learned that over and over in the heart. And I run late. I often am late to things. And that's a real challenge to me to do that. So... Um, yeah, definitely punctuality is important. I liked, in fact, on set, I like to try to be there before everybody else gets there. That feels, that, and the feeling you get on the flip side of to be there prepared before everyone else gets there, once you feel that, um, it's hard to go back. It takes a lot of work, but to know your scene backwards so that if there's a problem and you can go, no, 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 the guy would never have a red curtain on his window because he, that color reminds him of, uh, you just know that world so well, you can just instantly answer all those questions. You're not sitting there going, um, mm. yeah, you don't, being, there, there is such a great feeling after you've done the work and you've worked so hard to get there and everybody knows it, oh, it's so great, it's so great. I, I really wanted to go back to the sex analogy right then, but I probably should not. <laughs> but. I often notice that I'm unprepared when I'm really busy. So it's a lot of good things that are happening. Yeah. Yes. And, and you yes. never anticipate that that's going to be a problem. You just think, I want to have A, B, and C happen, and it's going to be great. But then what happens is you're not prepared for one of them yeah. or a few of them. And then... It can sabotage things in a way. Absolutely. This is the thing they don't teach you in film school is, is what, li what life can do to you when you're trying to make it. And oftentimes, the better the opportunity, the bigger it is, the more things like I don't have time to prepare for the job will happen. Um, or you know, even just getting a film off the ground. Like we'll, Oftentimes, we'll get in these jobs because everybody has to make a living. We'll end up working. 15 hours a day and we're too tired to prepare at the end or too tired to write that screenplay and you end up not, they don't teach you about that in film school. We all think and when we're 21 that we're just gonna have all this time to prepare and come to set and everyone's gonna be on the same team. That's, that, that's where the true test of who you are comes into play. Like, it doesn't matter if you haven't had time, you better, you better be prepared. If you don't have the time leading up then you should probably have started earlier, like, or something, but it's so important, like, and I think it does test your metal, for sure. So when you are early, what are the first, let's say, five things you do as a director? Let's suppose you've, you're in command, you're there super yeah. early, and you've coffeeed up, or I don't know, maybe not, just whatever. 
just you feel good and you're there early? What are the you know what? Days? Man, that's a great question. So I, there are many times I've been on set and there's no one there yet. And there is such a peace that, ha that can, because you know, there, it's like there's this energy in the room that you feel that it's coming because you know you're about to create something. Um, and the room is waiting. It's just in waiting. And probably the first thing I do is just to, to really uh, envelop at that, like breathe into it and lean into that. Like, you know, just to take a moment to, to drop into it. Um, I would say the second thing is, and I, I, I'll do this throughout the shoot as well, to uh, wake up and realize, man, I got some lights and all these people and a lot of these people are my close friends like to really like be present. That's so hard to do sometimes on a film set, but if you're there early and you have a chance to like really check in and be present and go through it all, like really setting your mind state, mental state before you start, that's, that's huge. Um, beyond that, I like to, you know, check through the script, make double, double check, dot all the I's and cross the T's. Yeah, did I say that right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, before I go, you know, make sure I know the intent of the scene I'm about to um, shoot that day, you know. Does this make sense? This is where we're going. Sometimes I will um, even pre-plan what I'm going to tell an actor. Because sometimes it can be hard to know what to say. But um, that's a big one for me, to be able to understand, okay, this is going to be a hard emotion to hit. How am I going to? how am I going to get them to that place? I'm going to try telling them this story or I'm going to, I'm going to try to tell them this kind of direction. Um, I'll do that a lot as well. Uh, yeah. So um, I don't know if that was five points, but that's a few of things that I definitely try to do. And you know what else I do for me personally, as a director, a lot of times I am so sensitive to, so there's the ups and downs to being like an emotional person. I'm a very emotive person. Um, that works really well for me when I'm working with actors because I can sense emotion and I'm looking to try to pull it out of you and I'm, I'm looking to see if you're shutting down or opening up or feeling defensive or you're feeling scared. Like I have to be, you have to turn those sensors on. Well, that can also work against me when I see that the crew is tired and I see that they don't want to be there or they're distracted. Um, so I, as my, one of my struggles is that I will sometimes not get for everything I want or sh keep shooting until I get what I want because I'm afraid of abusing the crew. I'm so terrified of like, I'm so like, you know what? I don't want the reputation of the guy that works everyone 17 hours and like not thankful, you know, like let's, you know, I want him to be proud, but you know what I mean? So I will sometimes have to talk myself into because this is what'll happen to me. We'll be shooting and someone will go, did you get it? I'm like, well, not quite, but I'm worried because I don't want you guys to have to keep working. And usually the crew will go, why are you crazy? We're here, let's just do it. <laughs> like that's, that's what usually happens. It's funny that they're trying to talk me into keeping going. It's just hilarious. But I will oftentimes, very importantly, look at my struggles and go, it's okay to ask for another if you need it. Like, you know, to. I'm essentially talking myself into it and, and kind of hyping myself up for that kind of day. Um, sure, when you're sensitive, or there's the one with the arms crossed that's just, you could just feel they're muttering under mm -hmm. their breath, you know, and, and you don't know what you've done, but yes. they're just totally mad at you and they're like, this isn't making sense. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, and, and so being a sensitive person, yeah. that's the curse. Oh, of I, it. I read that energy so well. And you know, the funny thing is, I've learned, is what my wife has taught me this, is that. Oftentimes when that happens, it has nothing to do with you. Sure. It's because they just got the call that their kids got in trouble at school or whatever. Like it's half the time it has nothing to do with you at all. Or that's just how they stand. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're cold. Yeah. They're just that guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, yeah. What mistakes have you made during the screenwriting process and how have you corrected them? Yeah, I'd say the biggest mistake for me is, is poorly taking criticism. Uh, getting really, I think one of the hardest things to do is, especially when you're writing a story that's close to you, is 
fighting back against someone who's trying to give you a critique or getting angry about it or whatever. Like, it's really hard to step back professionally. I mean, professionals who do this get used to that, but early on especially, I really had a hard time with that. Um, I think we all just assume that we're all geniuses when we start. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? pretty much. Uh, most of us aren't. Um, that was a, that's a big one, and, and it still sometimes is hard. Sometimes it might take me a minute to like, okay. But I had a friend of mine tell me one time that if I ever am in a position where I have to explain to you what my story is about after you've read the script, then I failed. If you should get it from the script. If they're not getting it, then that's a problem. You need to fix it. Like, I don't understand why she says this. If you have to explain it, then you need to rewrite the scene. Because you're not going to, what are you going to do, sit there when the movie's going in the theater and go, so she's doing it. <laughs> you know, that's, you, no, that doesn't, you've got to fix it. Um, <clears throat> man, and things like, uh, I would write things that are, say, comedy, and people read it and think that it's super serious and like missing tone. That, that took me a long time where I would have in my head the story idea, but it was just not translating. So, and that comes down to like crafting words, uh, sentence choice, word description. I had a screenplay actually called Fluke that was supposed to be kind of a thriller. And everyone, every time they'd read it, they'd think it was a comedy. And it was so frustrating to me. Like, why do you think this is a comedy? And then I realized one day someone says, well, it's probably because it's called Fluke. That sounds like a comedy. Oh, really? I, I, I never would have realized that. So uh, that has taken me a lifetime to figure out is just exactly how to structure a sentence to get the tone that you want. And it would happen to me. This is where I am thankful for corporate commercial work. Because you, because what that is, is your 10,000 hours of training. You're working and working and working and you're writing scripts for commercial corporate clients who aren't screenwriters. Right, and they're having to interpret what you're saying. And I would do a project and they'd look at it and go, I had no idea this is what you were trying to say. Or I didn't totally did not get that this was the tone. Um, it is vital for people to get that while you're writing it. Um, so yeah, I don't know if that would be qualified as a mistake. It was just a muscle that I had to keep working out until I figured out how to, to get it right. Um, and the only way to do that is by writing and writing and writing and writing and writing. Um, other things that I've learned is like how consistency is key when writing. What I know a lot of people who don't write consistently, who want to be writers, or are directors who want to get that screenplay done, and they'll say things like, I'm going to write it this weekend. Um, not that there's anything wrong with that, but for me, I made a commitment years and years ago to make a step every day towards my goal, my career goal. Um, now for me as a director, that doesn't always mean writing, but I found that if I try to write every day, even if it's putting a period on the end of a sentence, you know, it's the end of a long day, I'm super tired, I just sit down, open that screenplay up, I'll just finish out that sentence and go to bed, the story's in my head. And while I'm working, it's, it's in there, rolling around, because I feel like there's nothing worse than sitting down with a screenplay that you haven't looked at in a week or two, and you're like, oh yeah, that's right, that's where I was. I hate that, it's like dusting off the cobwebs, and you gotta clean your house first before you can even start. That just slows down your whole writing process. So for me, doing it consistently, daily, because th that speeds, and just it's like keeping the, it's like oiling the joints, you know, keeping things working. Um, that took me a long time to figure out as well, for sure. Um, what about that lovely person that stands up at a Q&A <laughs> and says, um, I noticed the scene was such and such. Uh, why did you do that? Yeah. <laughs> does, that, does that, is that good for you to hear that? Or? It's funny. Those, those are funny things. So there's, there's a couple of categories those fall into. If it's critiques, um, which those are often there, like, oh, I didn't like this. Um, <laughs> Usually there's, when I have a finished film, there is usually nothing you can say about it that I don't already know. Ah, man, that's opening scene, it's just way too long. Yeah, I know, I 
realize that. Like, you know, you don't, sometimes you don't know until it's done that you realize, oh boy, that scene didn't work. And then people call you out on it. So th that there's usually no surprise with that part. Um, on a side note, it's always funny to me that for film, film I feel in the arts is one of the unique things where people just seem compelled to tell you when they don't like it and specifically what they didn't like. I don't know if that happens with music or with, art, with painting or like, yeah, I didn't like your song. Didn't really speak to me. <laughs> yeah, but they do that with film. Like they just seem like, you didn't ask my opinion, but here it is, it, yeah. you suck. Uh, for some reason, that's a thing. I don't know why. But anyway, or the startup world. Like, yeah, I tried your app. Yeah, it bugged out. I did. I did. Kind of, <laughs> meh, meh. Yeah, it didn't really reach me. Um, so it's funny with film. So you know that develops a skin. But sometimes with Q and As, you 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 try to plan to hit audiences in a certain way, um, either to get them to think or to get them to laugh. Hopefully that works, but sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes people will ask questions about, yeah, why did you make that a comedy? I'm like, I never meant for that line to be funny. So those are usually, um, those that actually be kind of fun. Cause sometimes when, when a thing can hit, like this, you know, in the original Star Wars, the stormtroopers that are out there in the desert, well, a lot of times those guys like the glove broke in the middle of filming. So they just had to fix it somehow. and. Now it branched out a whole new group of stormtroopers because, oh, his uniform is slightly different. Well, they didn't plan that. It was an accident. And that's great when those kinds, those things, that stuff happens in filmmaking all the time. And it's really a wonderful surprise when it does. Fan theories, I think is what they call those. Um, if you can get your film to a point where if they're theorizing about certain things, that's awesome. Because now they're thinking about it. Um, yeah, but you know, Usually Q and A's are very simple kinds of questions. What'd you shoot on? That's usually the number one <laughs> question. What's your budget? Yeah. yeah. What's your budget? What'd you shoot on? Those are, yeah, those are usually, but yeah. But then there's some, there's some ones that are like writing savants that'll stand up and just, I know you feel like no, like, yeah. wow, you've really, you yeah. really studied this but and you got an good. angle to it. I you like that. that. Okay. And sometimes it can be, you know, they can go off on tangents, but. I find it an honor. If someone has taken that, taken it upon themselves to take that much time to invest their lives in your story, wow, that's, that's pretty cool. Like, that's a great way to look Even at if it. they didn't like it, like, wow, they really thought a lot about this. That's, that's really something else. Like, I, I think that's a big honor. I mean, isn't that part of why we did it? Because I saw a film when I was a kid that influenced me so powerfully and carried with me my whole life. To do that to someone else, you know, that's great. Well, that's an honor, it's a privilege. Okay, so labeling yourself a low budget indie filmmaker for whoever who's sort of taking on that title, how can filmmakers hurt themselves with trying to stay so frugal? How do they end up sabotaging themselves? Yeah. I know they have a, a limited budget, it's not that they're trying to stay in that realm, but it's just how Things yeah. are dictated at the moment with their financial circumstances, with the investors, crowdfunding, whatever, credit cards. But how does that somehow sabotage yeah. their production? I, well, I personally don't like to label myself like that. Um, I, I know some people who do. I think that's, that, that's such a weird thing to label yourself if that's what you're gonna choose to do. I'm a low budget filmmaker, that's just like, why not choose, I'm the guy that makes people ask questions about food. Or well, I don't, or you know what I mean? Like, I feel like that would be a healthier way to frame it as opposed to low budget. That's a, that's a strange way to like, cause it all, it's, it's sort of a downer on your work anyway. It's a, it's a <laughs> right. down mm -hmm. place to start. Yeah. <clears throat> so I think the trap that a lot of people fall into when they start to label it like low budget X, they start to, um, I made a motto of myself that years ago, I didn't. I never wanted to work on a film that was just a, I used to call them the just a films. Oh, this is just a slasher. You know, it's just, it, what that's doing is, is you're automatically lowering your expectations. Look, this is just a corporate video. Let's not break right. ourselves. Well, can't we do better? You know, I think that's the mistake. When there's no budget, look, there's no budget, we can't, break ourselves to do this. It's just a simple little drama about two people falling in love. Like, man, why, then why even make it? 
If you're going to do that, then why even you know, give the script to someone else who's not going to call it that and let them run with it? Um, other mistakes, I think, is lack of planning. The lower your budget, the more planning you need to do. I think it's inversely proportional. Like, you can't throw money at your problems. Um, you better think about every frame and every, you have to be so hyper efficient about the way you're shooting scenes, the way you're constructing, the way you're working with your actors. You can't afford for lack of communication when the budgets get low. And I don't want to hear the excuse that you can't make good art for cheap. That's BS. Yes, you can. I mean, have you seen like, I don't know, I really liked El Mariachi. It was, it was a great entertaining film for 6,000 bucks. Like Chris Nolan made following for, yes. I don't know what his budget was, but it was very around that budget. It's amazing. I was so frustrated when I first saw it too, because my first film was 12,000. And my first film had like mob scenes and car chases and two underwater sequences in it, like a really complex thing. And his is like, about a writer who follows a guy <laughs> <laughs> and his three characters shot in it. Oh man, Christopher Nolan, you're so bright. I know. Give me a chance. <laughs> but like automatically assuming that your project won't be good because of money is a huge mistake and not the place you want to start. That's oftentimes where you can make your best work. Where like the, we talked about Jaws earlier, the shark didn't work. So he had to think of a way to, to tell a story without a shark. A, a movie about a shark to tell a story without a shark. That's the most memorable part of that whole movie is the fact that you never see it. So looking at your project like that and not using money as your hindrance, maybe it's your opportunity to, to do something that no one has seen. Uh, that goes back to that looking at the problem with a, with a joyful excitement as opposed to like, ugh, roll your <laughs> eyes because we don't have the budget to solve our problems kind of thing. Um, I think that, that happens all the time, all the time. People just get frustrated that their budgets aren't bigger. Well, here's the thing. Budgets are never going to be big enough. I don't care how big your budget is. It's never going to be enough. Um, even if you're doing these big budget commercials, you're always going to run into the end of the budget at some point. It's just going to stop. It's going to have a cap, like, and you're always going to wish you had more. That never changes. And the better you get at functioning on that level, oh man, the better that's going to carry you when you're functioning on a larger level. I feel like sometimes though people bandy around that term low budget the same way maybe someone says, well, we're a nonprofit, mm -hmm. so we oh, can't, yeah, you know what I'm saying? So it's like this badge of like, we'd like this, but we can't pay for it kind of thing, but can you still give it to us? And that's the tough part because yeah. a lot of this is done with borrowed time or favors yeah. or borrowed locations, but that people then label themselves as yeah. such. And it's also a way that just as a nonprofit would say, well, we, sorry, we wouldn't be able to afford this. Can you donate this to us because we're a yeah. nonprofit? Yeah, and I think it'd be much better to be, instead of labeling yourself as low budget, labeling yourself as the guy that when people watch your film, they go, you had how much? Oh my God. Like, that's what you want. You know, um, but that comes from, again, planning, really being creative, making it clever, you know, all that stuff. You can do it. It's, it happens all the time. It happens all the time with people making something for nothing. That's the fun. And that's where it's fun. So the first camera you got your hands on was at this cable access? Yeah. In, in Oregon? Yeah. You got, okay, what kind of camera was it? I, the beta cam or something? Uh, probably, I think it was pre-beta. I think it was an S, uh, SVHS maybe, like old school with a big, it wasn't just a camera, <laughs> it was one with a, a oh deck attached to it. And I, you know, I'm trying to shoot, I think I did a little slasher film in, in uh, I was in high school, but yeah, like, oh man, it, uh, my mom hated it because she's, my mom's very religious. So like I'm making the slasher film with this. Ah, oh. but anyway, that was, takes me back. I'm very thankful to those people, you know, cause, and I, if this is an opportunity that they still do, I don't know why they wouldn't. I would highly suggest if anyone's having a problem getting access to cameras, that's a good place to go. Cause that's, that's where you have to, you have to keep practicing. 
Yeah. And uh, I look back on that, very fond memories. Like, man, the first time I was able to finally play, man. Do you remember when you walked into that studio? Like, how, oh, you yeah. were 16, you just go into the studio and... Yes, absolutely. And just like, again, I felt like my feet were leaving the ground. Like, just of like, wow, this is... Because you, it's like... It's like you want to build a house and someone just pulls up in front with a truck full of tools. It's like the possibilities here to create that magic is, that's how I felt. That's, I still feel that way going into a camera house, going into a grip house, you're just looking at the lights and stuff and imagining what you can make. Like that feeling has never left. Um, that's why I keep doing it. Like it's, it's the possibility, yeah. A project called The Record Keeper, mm -hmm. this was brought to you? That one was a, uh, kind of, yeah. It was, um, someone asked me if I wanted to adapt a book. It was a, essentially a religious history book. That, that was a whole interesting process because uh, I didn't want to do it at first. Because the book is, it's based on this book that's about where Christianity went after the Bible. You know, the, book, the first chapter of the book is in 60 AD and it chronicles, you know, Martin Luther and, you know, goes on for 2000 years. Well, that's not a narrative. That's a history book. And it's like making a movie out of European history. Who's your hero? And I looked at it. I'm like, I mean, you don't have the budget to create. I mean, even Martin Luther, that's a, I mean, your period piece. I mean, 60 AD is the first chapter. It's Romans. <laughs> Roman soldiers invading Jerusalem and tearing down a temple. How are you going to shoot that for no money? Like, there's no way. And I was like, this is, you guys are out of your mind. No, no, no. Yeah. So I walked away from it and then they kept coming back and like, you know, how are you going to, uh, oh, please do it. Please do it. And so I had to start thinking, and this again came from the low budget. They didn't have a lot of money. So I had to think, how can you make a story that transcends thousands of years of history, interesting and care about what happens in each era. The only way to do that is to have a character that you follow through these events. Um, that's either someone who like had time travel or, or someone who's immortal. Well, it's a religious history book. How about angels? That makes sense. So like they, they're immortal and let's follow their journey of seeing these events and that's kind of where it all began so yeah it, it came from there and ended up being one of the most um creative endeavors of my life like it was a it was a really amazing experience making that film where did you film it uh, that was up we shot, filmed in uh, oregon and in arizona it was a <laughs> we shot in a prison believe it or not our set was in a prison because it was a, up there there's a I don't know if it's still available, but they built this state-of-the-art prison and then they never, they ran out of money to run the prison. So it never housed a single inmate. <clears throat> it's paid for by the state in this big empty building. So, and then they couldn't charge to rent it. You only have to pay for utilities and a guard. So the, the cost of getting this entire facility was so cheap. Um, you know, it was great. And so we built all our sets in there and, and used that as our home base. And, um, that was, yeah. And then we did some exteriors out in, uh, Page, Arizona, out in Horseshoe Bend and, and, uh, Owl Canyon, which is next to Antelope Canyon, the famous canyons in Arizona. It's like one of the photographers paradise. So we went out there. That was a really great. Yeah, that was fun. And you adapted the, the, the book? I did sort of. Yeah. So I had to, I had to hit certain themes and certain events. Um, but we ended up you know, the, the story became about angels and it's essentially the story, the history of man to the eyes of an angel, which that became a really fun thing because angels, even in most cultures, don't have a lot of emotion with them. Like they don't really know who they are or where they come from. And there's very little written about, there's a lot written, but very little is known where they, who they are, where they come from, how they feel about certain events. They'll come up and show up and maybe protect somebody or make an announcement that then they leave. We never know what built up to the announcement that they made. You know, like if you're speaking from a Bible perspective, they might announce someone's being born, but then that's it. They're gone. So the idea of exploring who they were and how they felt about certain earth events was a lot of fun to like try to and in a very complicated writing challenge, because when you're trying to write 
uh, say, a good angel who can't sin, right? They can't disobey God. Well, that's really hard to write that. How do you write a protagonist that can't disobey an order? That was tough. But they can have opinions about certain things. They can, they can question. You know, they're not cardboard. So, man, it made it fun to, like, experiment in that world. And, like, uh, we ended up starting the story kind of back at the beginning of the creation of the world. Like, as they're marching through all these, like, for example, they see Noah's Ark and the flood and all that. So, like, angels reacting to God committing genocide. How does a good angel feel about that? That was a fun story to tell. Like it really made it emotional and impactful. And you're telling stories that people have know the, uh, you know, like Noah's Ark. We all know how it ends. So it's not going to be exciting if you just tell that story. But if you tell it from the angel's side, ooh. That, and it became such a fun writing exercise. And um, yeah, there, there's so much more. We, we, and we had to end up cutting the story short because there was so much uh, area we could explore. That's what made it so much fun. Not to mention the fact of who they are, what they wear. That was one of the first questions that was the hardest is, what are they wearing? I was like, I, I don't know. Because, uh, you know, we mostly see angels in their white robes and their wings, and I didn't want wings. White robes, I wanted them to feel like real uh, beings and entities. So, like, what, what do they wear? I mean, technically, if you follow, say, the Bible, mankind wasn't wearing clothes at the beginning. So, do angels wear pants? I, that seems kind of wrong. Do we <laughs> naked angels? <laughs> so, what do you, so, I, you know, my first thought to the wardrobe person was I think that they're, um, I think that they're military. We'll go with military. And then she goes, okay, well, which military? Are we talking present day? Like Marines, or are we talking like Roman soldiers? Are we talking which continent, which nation, which era? Like, oh man, I don't know. So we ended up going with steampunk, which is, if you don't know what steampunk is, it's, a, um, it's an aesthetic, which is very cool. It's like um, if the information age had happened in the steam era, like in the Victorian age, but steam t powered technology, steam powered computers and and things like that. It's a really fun thing. It's top hats and long tails. And it, it just fits so perfectly into this world because it's otherworldly, but sort of grounded. And it's got this fun back and forth. And so we ended up, and then that, that inspired the entire, like what the office looks like. Cause we didn't want to go with the foggy floor and you know, like heaven we usually see. I wanted an office that looked like they're really there working. And oh man, that was a fun world to explore. So it helped make it all real and grounded and, and all that. I was going to bring up the, what was it, the angel character, but he was like the sarcastic angel. Oh, uh, the fallen angel. No, no. John Travolta played an angel. Oh, Michael. Yeah. <laughs> it's actually Michael. really funny. But. Well, and that's an interesting comparison because <laughs> angel stories, uh, all the angel stories that I've seen are generally like this, like the movie Michael, where it's a, you know, where heaven is painted as this terrible, boring place where you can't have any fun. So the whole premise of Michael is it's the last hurrah on earth. He comes down and he, he's, I think he's, I think he's having sex, isn't he? And then he's eating a lot of sugar and drinking coffee. He's like doing all these bad things. <laughs> right. Like, because this is, earth is where it's at. And heaven sucks. I got to go back there. So that's, that's very common. I mean, uh, City of Angels with Nicolas Cage was sort of the same kind of movie where it's angels can't feel the wind or water, but humans have it. And so he gives up his angelic whatever to be a human and falls in love with Meg Ryan, who is killed in a car accident. Spoiler alert. And it's just, I wanted to tell a story with a different viewpoint on all of that and really make it about good versus evil and, and how do we feel about these events and uh, how do they feel? You know, how are they reacting to the first time they see someone get killed? What does that do? How does that, you know, a, a, like for example, one of the themes we explore is a fallen angel a demon having PTSD over death. Like that's not something I've ever seen before. Like having nightmares about watching someone die for the first time. Um, and, and them saying, this is way, this punishment is awful. Like I can't, I don't know what death looks. Dealing with that. That, that was so great to explore all that. 
Yeah. Right, because we think of, let's say, Ghost, uh -huh. Patrick Swayze, where he's kind of like caught. He in doesn't want to, you know. In between. Right, and it's torture for him to kind of not be there. And, yeah. and, to, and, and then, you know, Whoopi Goldberg is, you know, there's this comedic yeah, right. thing, but, but that he, he, he's kind of caught between these two worlds. So it's not really um, hell or heaven for him. He's sure. just sort of like stuck. Yeah. A stuck yeah. spirit or something. Yeah, and there's a, yeah, it's a funny, the messaging there. Like, it's just this negative, it's like a negative view of the afterlife in a way. You go there and you lose. Because he didn't want to let her go. So, I wanted to try to paint a different story about this, you know, very clear what's right and what's wrong and, and how do humans factor in and what will we do to protect them. And I think there's way more area to explore in that as well which I'm doing, <laughs> but yeah. How is this project, The Record Keeper, the best thing that happened to you and then possibly I would, the worst thing? Yes, that's funny that you say, yeah, I, I call, I've referred to Record Keeper as the best worst thing that's ever happened to me. It's, it, it, on one hand, it was incredibly creative and wonderful. I met so many great artists from that, yeah, um, but, um, that was a, a work for hire, that project. It was, uh, I was working for a big organization. They wanted to make this thing. At the beginning, it was to promote this book. They're a very conservative organization. They're a religious organization. So they had certain judgments about film and movies being, you know, they're, you know this is a, a religious organization that doesn't, you know, no drinking, no dancing, you know, very, very conservative. Well, they ultimately didn't like the product at the end. Even though I tried to warn them about what it might look like, this is a big lesson for me about making sure that everyone understands what this ending product will be before it's finished. That's, that's a challenge. Well, they ended up not releasing it, and it was a big controversy within their organization about uh, whether or not they should release it, and um, it got ugly. It was my first experience with things like negative press, where my name is mentioned in press in certain circles about controversies and things, uh, high-end political things. I mean, we're not talking national political things, but within their organization, like being caught up in some of that. Like, I, I mean, I know that filmmakers on A-level projects can have this happen, but I'd never experienced, no one ever trains you for that kind of thing. How you react when the public is watching. Um, and it was very painful because we threw everything into that. I personally just put my whole life on the line for this project. And it was something special. Like we created something very special. Like we all knew it. Walking around on set, you could feel electricity uh, while we were filming these scenes. People just like, this is the coolest thing we've ever seen. And then it, you know, because we all felt like we were on this launching pad and then it doesn't come out. Uh, it ended up getting leaked. It's, it's, you know, it's found its way out there, it's, but it's never been officially released. It has played in festivals, but the, the stain of never having it out there, which of course, you know, from a, a simply an investor standpoint, for future jobs, they look at this as, well, you've never made a film that's gotten distribution. Or at least they're talking about that one. It's like, it, it reflects negatively on me, which is, it's not even my fault, right? So. That was a real challenge. It, it, it ended up like um, being so discouraging that I considered maybe not doing film anymore. Like I thought maybe this isn't right for me. Uh, these are the things they don't tell you about in film school, like on, on the utter disappointment that can happen. And sadly, this happens all the time. And not just this, it's, you can't blame this organization for that. It right. happens in A-level movies all the time. All the time, read like read stories of Joss Whedon and how much he struggles. You know, with a lot of the projects he does, shows that get canceled when they're halfway through. It happens all the time. Um, <clears throat> there is no manual for how to deal with some of that, where you you've sacrificed and fought so hard for something that that everybody hates or or whatever, or certain political people or powerful people decide not to release it, or butcher it, re-edit it and put it out in a way that you didn't like. That's why they have director's cuts. Um, that was a real challenge and it, uh, it, it, there was a lot of lessons to be learned about, I think the temptation is to not put so much of yourself into things. I don't feel like that's correct. 
I think that's, that's what made the project so special is by how much I put in, because it's also magnetic, because it draws people to it. But I think the lessons I learned from that were communication on, every time I've been in some sort of conflict, usually on set, it becomes, it comes down to the fact that of communication. Someone didn't understand something that was supposed to happen. And the frustrating part about film sets is sometimes you have to say it 50 times because someone's on their phone, someone's not listening, someone's not up to speed. Someone, I thought we were doing this. Doing, you know, th That's where all the conflict starts. In this case, it was a little bit of the client not understanding the vision. Even though I tried to explain it as clearly as possible, it, they still did not quite get it. So it just underscored how important it is that everyone knows what they're getting. And that as a filmmaker, it makes me, I have to make sure to do things like mood reels or photos of the character. Like this is kind of an idea of what I'm looking at or any, anything you can do. Because remember, I am a visual person, but they may not be. They may respond to text. They may respond to sounds more than, you know, you have to you try to utilize all the senses to make sure everyone gets the vision. And if it's a problem, Let's talk it out before we get to the end because that's where the problems happen for us. Um, yeah, and just sometimes once your project is over, you just have to step away from it and let it be what it's going to be. Because uh, it was easy for me to be angry at the fact that it wasn't released. But what if I choose to do that, that I miss the blessing that I got out of it of because it wasn't released, it got more attention than it ever would have. And it got me to places that, you know, like I did a worldwide festival tour on it because they, they just allowed that because I wasn't making money on it, but they did allow that because of the controversy. If they had done, if that had not happened, they would have sold it and it probably would have disappeared on Amazon or something. Um, so it got way more publicity than it ever would have before. Uh, and that's a really good thing. That's a, that's a great thing. Um, yeah, it, it just was, uh, and I'm still learning lessons from that. And it's, and it's kind of incredible to me, the people who were touched by that film. Um, I still get people emailing me about things they saw in it and th how it moved them and how many times they watched it. And, and they don't have DVD. They just have it, they're just finding remnants on YouTube that are out there. Like, yeah. It, <clears throat> and I, this underscores also the power of storytelling because it was because the story was told well, it caused a deep emotional reaction from people, both on, on both sides, both good and bad. Um, the people that fought for it, vehemently fought for it, and it got ugly. The people who fought against it, vehemently fought against it, and it got ugly. Like it was, it was just was a crazy experience, like crazy. If a filmmaker's in a similar situation, what would your advice be to them? Well, so yeah, conflict and this kind of thing. I would love to tell you that it's, it's uncommon. It does happen on, on all sorts of levels, right? Like it could be a client video, an instructional video for the smallest of client that you, you turn it in and they don't like it or they change the edit, like, you know, or it could be in the huge national level. I've had both. And you have to be so careful with how you react. Um, because when you're making art, and I don't care if it's a wedding video or the feature film of your dreams, you're gonna have an emotional attachment to it. Um, for me, I have to make sure that I take a minute before I respond sometimes. Especially if I'm very, if I find myself really angry and frustrated, sometimes I need to, I need to wait a day before I respond. Or not, not fire back that text. Like, because the, this is, oh, I cannot underscore how important this is. How you react to bad news will determine if you work with them again. Um, if, if you blow your top and say ugly things, because it's so tempting sometimes, they will probably say, okay, well, we're gonna hire someone else next time. You know, even though the situation's frustrating, you still, we still all need to work. And you know, there may be a lot of positive things that could happen from X client, right? 
So yeah, being careful about your responses. And sometimes, sometimes I'll have other friends read an email response to make sure it doesn't sound mean, you know? Um, this is where being a pro comes in to uh, things like, I had a, a client one time that um, I finished the product, I handed it to them. They didn't like it, they wanted to cut out a big middle piece. This is a, a narrative thing for corporation and I got so angry about that, like I was, I was really upset about it. And so in my own, in my office, a place that the client never visited, I, re, I had to make a duplicate of my timeline in the edit machine and I called it, you know, castrated version. Well, and I'm thinking, well, no one's gonna see that. Well, when I exported the video, it automatically titled it that. I didn't catch that and I sent it to the client. This is a, one, this is a huge mistake. Like, it's embarrassing to talk about because fortunately, the guy I, that saw it was like, Oh, that was a nice little jab, little barb, you know. I changed the title for you before I sent it to the CEO. Thank God he did that, but you have to be so careful with that stuff about things you say and who you're saying it to and, and where that might go. This is where being, vent to your partner. Vent to your buddies, don't vent to your client um, and to those decision makers. Uh, yeah, that's that's tough. I mean, because look at, look at, I mean, I think a good example is Josh Trank, I think his name, who did Fantastic Four. Remember when that movie was coming out and how he tweeted negative things about the film right before it was released and it turned out to be this big thing that he was now blackballed? Like, that is such a lesson for filmmakers on, yeah, he, maybe he had good reasons to be upset, but boy, you, you, you take it to Twitter, that's a, don't do that. that you can't take that back. That's out there now. Can't. Like, that can ruin your career. That can make you, that kind of thing can make you move to another city. Like, yeah, so easy. You have to watch yourself on that. So despite your love for film, mm -hmm. going back to Close Encounters, seeing it this being this magical experience, at one point you really thought you would n never yeah. be a filmmaker, a director, not even, Short films for fun? Yeah, I mean, you know, it's I mean, my case and probably the case of every filmmaker out there, you, you, you see that spark and you love it and you fight and you sacrifice everything to get there and you do it and you do it and you do it. And then it doesn't quite happen the way you think. And you're not plucked out of obscurity like some of these guys are. You're still working in the trenches for years and that's a little, it can get frustrating. And then in my case, I did a film that had a lot of controversy around it and was never ultimately released. And it was so utterly devastating because after so many years of just working and working and working and sacrifice, this film looked like it was gonna really be something. And then instead it, it's not released and there's a lot of controversy and bad press and all these ugly things. And it just, it devastated me so much that I, I, I didn't know if it was worth it. And I circled the drain. Because it's hard to go from something like that, from a film that was so artistically satisfying, with such a great script and all these things, to go from that to going back to trying to find work as a doing more corporate stuff. Like, I was like, how do you even, what am I gonna do? Like, I, I circled the drain for a long time. Like, it, it, because my life was not turning out the way I thought it would. And this is everyone's story, right? Everyone. Like we all think we know how it's going to turn out and life does this to you and goes back this way. And, you know, so for, for a few years, I didn't know my wife suggested to me, maybe we should just sell everything and go teach English in Korea. And I seriously thought about it. Um, and, uh, it, it got to a point with me where I, I had to just, it, it stripped everything away from me. It got me back to the basics of what do I really love? It, it, it forced me to take another look at what do I love about the film industry and filmmaking and storytelling. And I found that spark again. Like I just, I love moving people and crafting stories. And I love to see people laugh when they're supposed to or jump when they're supposed to. Like I have worked my whole life for that. It, there's no feeling and no, I, I don't know anything else. I couldn't do anything else. Um, and 
I, and I also had to, you know, and take that experience and try to see all the good that came out of it because a lot of good did and <laughs> move forward, which is, it's not easy, but yeah, it, Yeah, that's the other thing they don't tell you in film school is what happens when discouragement hits, because it does. Like, it can, you know, especially when the success doesn't come it, when you think it will, you know? Or like, it builds up to it and it, it and, feels like you're being blamed or something. Yeah, I mean, there is, like, and I started this with, by saying this, there is, we are sold on this idea that that filmmaking will happen in a certain way. Like the Duplass brothers were speaking at a film festival years ago or whatever. I saw, I read this article somewhere and they said, here's what you do. You make your film for 500 bucks and then you get distribution on it. You'll make some money on it. Then you make your second film and you put a big star in it and that'll do well on the festival circuit. Yeah, well, it might happen that way, but it might not. For most people, that's not how it happens. You'll make your film and you'll mortgage your house and then nothing happens. That's so common. That happens all the time. The film disappeared on Netflix and that's the end. And now what? And you know, you're not discovered and you're not picked from obscurity. And so then what do you do from there? Do you keep going? How much do you really love this? How hard are you willing to write that next script, get the next one going, fight for the next client with everything you've got um, and fight that cynicism that wants to just rear its ugly little head. Um, yeah, that's, that's where the love of it will really, you, you better discover it. You better know why you love it. Um, and I do think it's worth fighting for. All the negativity, all the challenges, all the frustrations is worth fighting through to get there because it really is great. Like when you're on set and it's working and you're telling that story, and the actors are there and the cinematography look up. It, it's so like all of that disappears and just fades away. And you're just like, wow, I'm creating this amazing moment and it's working. Yeah, it, it's worth fighting for. No question. Do you think that was the main good that came out is knowing how bad you wanted to fight yeah. for it? Knowing that you could have packed up and mm -hmm. nothing wrong with teaching, but. There's nothing wrong with teaching. It, it, oh. it just wouldn't have been, you would have been thinking about the films you wanted to make. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> okay, no. guys, let's, let's take out our notebooks and then. <laughs> I had to be stripped back to the basics mm -hmm. and, and go back to rediscovering what I loved. And yeah, it, it, that's, I think that's healthy sometimes. I think it's good to do, you know? Struggle is good. Hard work is good. It's a, it can be a real positive thing. It doesn't feel good when you're in it, but afterwards, anyone who's ever struggled usually looks back and says it was a good thing. I mean, you look at, like David Sanborn, famous saxophone player, had polio as a kid, you know? And he started playing, he, he's, the doctor told him as a kid, he either needed to start some sort of exercise like swimming or a wind instrument. So he picks up saxophone. James Earl Jones had a stutter. And now he's the voice of Darth Vader with the, one of the most memorable voices, all because he had to work his voice and work through that struggle to get there. Most people who do great things, Nelson Mandela, I'm reading his book right now, like the struggles he went through and he became one of the most inspiring leaders in the world because of the struggles he went through and how great that made him as a leader. Like, struggle's good. It's a positive thing. I just watched the Miles Davis documentary. It was great and just, dad didn't want him to be a jazz musician. He came from sort of a wealthy family and just all the things that he went through. He didn't want to come back to the States. He really wanted to be in... Paris, where all the artists were, and just I mean, his whole journey, he had to reinvent himself several yeah. times within sort of that genre. And there were a few years where he just put down his instruments and wouldn't, he wouldn't do anything. And he fell prey to drugs and oh, wow. just they thought he was done. And then turned out he wasn't, you know, and he, he reinvented himself each time. And he just kind of talked about how a great artist always have to keep reinventing. They can't stay stagnant. Yeah. You know, I mean, you've talked about filmmakers being in a rut Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt being yeah. in a rut? What do you do to shake things up? You know, it's funny about the rut. So like everyone looks at the film, well, any success of life, but filmmaking in specific, we all look at it like this mountain that we're climbing and we're looking at the peak, you know, oh, that, if I could direct the next Marvel movie or whatever, that's the peak. 
Well, I don't see it that way. I think we're all ants crawling across a plowed field. It's flat <laughs> and it goes like this. And as an ant climbing over that first little rise might be landing your first gig. Maybe, maybe it's landing any gig, right? You crest that hill and, oh, whew, I'm working in film. And then you, you know, then immediately, as soon as you get there, you look at the next gig. The next, maybe the next mountain is uh, directing for the first time, right? God, you climb and you finally, oh, you get it. You cross over and you get into the other. So, you know, that's normal. That's what we all, we're all ants crawling across this field with our own little goals and things that we're trying to do. Well, what can happen is, is let's say your first gig, you land your first gig and it's working for reality television as an editor. Perfectly respectable job, you know. Well, you, you get over that rise and you end up in that little pocket that's and you're safe from the wind and you're not struggling to make the rent. And whew. But if you're not careful, you'll stay there because what can happen is, is you'll end up five years later and, oh man, you know, there's that next rise right in front of me that that rise was to write that feature screenplay I've always meant to write and I never have done it because I'm too busy editing for reality television or whatever. That, that's your rut. Every time you crest one of those things and you end up in the safeness of the trough, it can become a rut if you're not careful. Now, I'm not saying that editing for reality television is a bad thing. It's purely on your own perception on where you want to be. And also because the, the playing field is level, you know, because maybe you want to go several lump humps over and get to say, making directing for television, doing all the, whatever the latest TV show is, CSI or what, uh, that's not even on anymore, I don't think, but like, <laughs> you're, you're over here. Well, maybe you don't, you get there, you don't like it. And you want to go back and teach. You go back across the field. You're not going down. You're making a lateral move over here to go something that you enjoy. Maybe you just loved making documentaries more than you ever loved doing television, and that's totally fine. And it, you know, but though that's how it is. Like every every success can become a rut, um, and you just need to. This is why I think. This is why I made the commitment years ago to absolutely make sure I'm making a forward step every single day. Some sort of either writing that screenplay, reading an article in American Cinematographer, watching a film courage video or whatever it is, you know, like doing something to continually hone and improve your craft every single day. Uh, I don't care how hard you, uh, tired you are, you know, it, keep improving, keep growing, keep pushing and striving. And all of a sudden one day you're going to realize you've mastered it. Do you know when you're in a rut? When you've oh, been? Oh, I think you do. Oh, you do. Yeah. Sometimes it takes, it might take someone to wake you up. Um, I think people somewhere deep inside know. I think some, a lot of us feel that we're already in a rut. I think if you're not being challenged, um, that's a big sign. If you're going to work and it's just kind of, uh, and it's no longer hard, that's a that's a bad sign. Um, probably means that you're there, yeah. And um, Or if you've done I, I, this is hard to say. I, I would say if you've done the same thing for a long time and never changed. Uh, but I, I don't mean that having a job for a long time is a negative thing. I mean, like, if you're just doing the same thing over and over and never trying something new within, even with, let's say you're a teacher and you just teach out of the same book for 20 years without ever researching something else or trying new teaching methods or experimenting with different ways, looking at what worked and what didn't work and changing it up sometimes. I think that's important because you can stagnate. Um, yeah. And you've taught before, you've done yeah. like your own classes. What, what's one of the most common questions that you've been asked by some of the- How to work with actors. Oh, okay. That's the one everyone wants to know because that's the hardest thing to do, how to work with an actor. It's, uh, and it's funny to me that that's the hardest question. And you know what's weird is actors will often ask me, actually actors will often thank me for directing them because they say most people don't, which is an interesting thing. But yeah, how do you work with an actor? How do you get them to do what you want them to do? And I, here, here's my, I have a theory on that too. I have a theory on all these things, but directors are mechanical people by nature and they're multitaskers. This is a good thing. You, you kind of need to be because when you're on set, you're being asked 400 questions simultaneously all the time. 
So you only want the red shirt or the blue shirt? Or do you want the, you know, what, what lens are we on? 25, 35, you thinking longer? You know, or Dolly, Steadicam. Uh, what color do you like? Do you like this color on the wall? Is it, you know, what, you know, is this the scene where Bob shows up or Jill shows up? You know, it's just these, you're, you're constantly shuffling and juggling and I'm just trying to go to the bathroom. <laughs> you know, this is, that's the nature of filmmaking. And it's fun. That energy is really fun. The actor will come on and go, um, how do I be deeper? That's a different question because every other question you dealt with on set is a mechanical one, a binary one. Uh, you know, it's red or blue. It's, is this a 25 mil lens or, a, you know, 100 mil, you know, why, you know, you can click a box or flip a switch and it gives you your answer. Um, actor is not that way. They, they are a person, they're an emotion. Um, and I think this scares a lot of directors, which is why they hide in video village and shout their direction to the actor on set way over there. Directing actors, especially when you're new at it, I'm often reminded of the very first time I held a baby because it doesn't talk, it just wiggles and it's kind of, and sometimes it's drooling and do that. And you're like, um, I, uh, I don't know what to do with this thing. Like that's how it can feel. It's scary. And this is where you get the classic direction. The, the, the classic direction for directors who don't know what they're doing is take it up a notch. There is no more mechanical dis words than that phrase. Take it up a notch. Here, let me take your emotional dial and <laughs> that's where that comes from. Um, <clears throat> can, can you be more ang angrier? Can you be sadder? The, you know, they want to dial up and down. Well, when you're dealing with a human, it's a relationship. It's um, an intent. They, now, of course, good actors can probably interpret what you're saying, but you can't rely on that. And that's, this is one thing that drives me crazy when I hear people say, well, your key to good directing is casting. Yeah, it is, but you know, if you're just gonna let your actors do all the work without you saying something to them, they still wanna know your point to the scene or a general direction, because you're looking at the entire 30,000 foot view of your story. They still wanna know what you want. Um, or if they're getting there for you. So you can't totally rely on that. And it's also not realistic because every single project that you're on, let's say you do your indie film. Well, do you know how many times it happens where the, the, the investor says, I'm gonna give you the money for the film, but my daughter has always wanted to be an actress, right? And she's never acted before. And suddenly you as the director have to deal with that. Look, every single for every job on the set, you know, your DP, your AD, your your production designer, your wardrobe person, they're all experts in their field. And you could come on not knowing anything about any of those departments and be fine. Your DP will carry you because they that's what they do. The one job that no one will carry you is directing your actors. You better know how to talk to them. And that's the one thing that almost no one understands how to do. It's crazy to me. This is why a lot of people say you should take an acting class. And I think that's not enough. You should regularly take one and even better, if you really want to learn, teach one. Um, I did this in my own personal journey. I started, I just took four actors and I said, come to my studio. I'm gonna give you a scene from a play. I'm just gonna to try to direct it and see without any cameras or lights, take that out of the equation. All I have are my words. And let me see if I can make you connect on a deeper level. That's terrifying. Cause what do you say if they're not connecting? Two people talking and they're not connecting. There is no switch that will make that happen. It comes to a relationship. And I had an actor friend tell me one time that an actor's performance is a reflection of the director. If they are not opening up, it's probably because you're not opening up. If they are not feeling as deeply as you want them to feel, then that probably means that you're not feeling as deeply as you want. And I've had this happen on set where it's like, I, in, in fact, when I was experimenting with working with actors, I had an actress come to me and she says, I'm, and I was telling her like, you're not opening up to your scene partner. You, you're, you need to open up. <laughs> I'm a mechanic still, I'm trying to turn the knob, open, open. It's not working. 
Um, and she was frustrated. She said, yeah, I get this note all the time and I don't know what the problem is. And so that's where I got this advice. Maybe it's a reflection of the director. So I said, okay, well, you know, that's interesting about that is because she is not someone I personally care for. You know, I, she's a nice person, but I didn't really connect to her. So I was resisting getting to know her or opening up personally to her. Now I'm not telling her this, I'm just being honest. So the next time she showed up, I made a point to ask her about her kids, to get to know her a little bit and just to like, maybe I can find a way for me to personally as a director connect to who she is. And she bloomed. <clears throat> I get really emotional talking about this, but it's so vital because that's what you need. You need them to open up and be there because that's what the camera sees. You want them to see that look in their eyes that gets them to be there. And it requires you as a director to be open as well. <clears throat> I get emotional about this stuff because, because I think it's important. I think Video Village becomes the shelter to shout your directions at because they're doing something you're terrified to do. Actors are doing the thing that is, un that is unnatural for the rest of us to be naked in front of the world, not just physically sometimes, but emotionally. To really, those actors that you're drawn to are the ones that are just so raw. Joaquin Phoenix being one, like you, you just, you can't take your eyes off him because he's just so out there. That's what you need. That requires you as the director to be there right there with them. So when it comes to directing actors, that's where you begin. In suppression, in the movie I just did, we had a scene where towards the end of the film, the actor really, it was the climactic, emotional climax of the film. And he really had to just fall apart and just break open. And he, uh, I was scared. I was terrified of the scene. I was terrified from day one that the scene was coming. Um, I hadn't worked with this actor before. Uh, and he was, I knew he was scared. It was his first leading role in a movie. Um, and we, were, we both hadn't mentioned this scene all the way up and I purposely wasn't saying anything about it because I didn't want him to know I was scared. Uh, but I could tell that he was. So we get to the day and using all these things I've been just telling you, well, I started the day by just telling him about some of my biggest mistakes and some of my own personal struggles. And, and the, the, the scene was about him opening up about his father. And so I just started telling him stories about my life and asking him questions about his and, and things he'd been through just really as a human offset while they're lighting and stuff, just as a human, just talking, just opening up and you're getting emotional. It's like, you know, connecting person to person. So then when it came to time to do the scene, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, we put the camera, it was a very, you know, intimate shot. We got up close and I, you know, I hate video village personally. I like to have an own monitor and I want to sit right there with the actor so that we're very close. If it's an emotionally powerful scene, it's important, I think, to be physically close. So they're not yelling anything, you're just right there with them. I got there with them, we rolled camera and I just told him, okay, I'm not going to say action. All I'm going to say is you don't have to hold on to this anymore. Put my hand on his back. <clears throat> and I, I'm sorry, I keep getting emotional, but he just boom, he just blew up in the scene like it was amazing. And I just sat there right there with him physically until he just, it was, it was a beautiful performance. It was beautiful, <clears throat> but it required enormous amounts of terror from me to open up, to allow that to happen. And this also requires a lot of emotional maturity because I have to be able to, in this state, of if they're say if they're, you know, I keep saying deep emotion and crying and stuff, I have to be able to be emotional with them, but turn right around to the DP and say, so when we do this, make sure you push while I'm emotional. You know, it, it, it it's, that's hard to do, to be like that. Um, but that's what we're asking the actors to do. That's really what their job is. And once you start to understand that and be comfortable with that kind of emotion, um, then you can start to learn how to talk to them about different emotions. So classic direction things are, you know, result direction, you hear that, be angrier. That's, that's a result direction. I, you know, if you read uh, Judith Olson's book, I believe it's called Directing Actors. It's a really good book. She, she, uh, there's a m method in the book, she talks about using words like punish them or threaten or tease. I'm gonna to go to the store. Okay, I want you to say that line, but threaten me with that. 
You know, that, 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 that's great. Actors love that stuff. Um, sometimes I like to, if they're not, say, getting angry, or if I know that's what I need them to be, is more angry and more dug in, I might go, this is the last thing you can say to them ever. This is the end of the conversation. Now come at it that way. Uh, sometimes I'll even go, okay, that was amazing, but we can go deeper. Let's dig a little bit deeper. Um, these, that's not resolve directing, that's a relational thing. Sometimes I'll have their scene partner tell them something that I might trigger them. Now, I'll say this, but this is, you have to really be careful with that because it's not a trick. It's not um, being mean to the actor. It's not abusing them, which you, we've heard stories yes. like that on mm -hmm. set. That's, I cannot tell you, that's not acting. I've heard store, horror stories of people saying, like say racial insults to someone to get them to be angry. That's, that's not directing. That's just being a jerk. Right. And that's not, you do that, you're going to ruin the trust of your actor and they'll shut down for you. They won't come back. And in you're going to acting class too. Sorry. Oh, yeah. it happens all the time yeah. in acting mm -hmm. classes mm -hmm. and it pisses me off because it's not, it's mean, it's unfair. They're trying to open up and being emotional and you're just abusing them. That's what you're doing. That's, and you're going to get a reputation for being that way. Um, so, but what I mean is like, you know, all right, right, you know, I'll maybe whisper to the actor. I've done this before where I'll say, ask them a question that's not in the script. In character. Okay, okay. So, in action. So, what is your favorite color anyway? And it's great because <laughs> you'll get, what you'll get is a, just the actor authentically being, this works great with kids too, by the way, to get them, if they're struggling with line readings and they, they're reading it the same way, that happens a lot, where they'll learn it with their parents a certain way, but they're having a hard time breaking that pattern. You can get the other actor, if they're an adult especially, to like play with them a little bit, get them to ask other questions. These are ways you can get, what you want, your goal is to get it to be real. We want truth in the scene. That's the goal, always, no matter what genre you're working with. So doing things like that is really helpful um, sometimes. And it's important also to pay attention to the physical things that they like. Some actors are physical. Make them clench their fist, make them ball up. Some actors really respond to that. Um, having them say things is, a, is another way before the take starts. You know, have them apologize to their scene partner. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And then, okay, now action. Uh, you know, um, being emotionally available and in in tune also comes to play in when you see them resisting you. Understanding that, uh, understanding, oh, they're scared. They're worried about this scene not looking good. Okay, they're worried about being humiliated because of what they're doing. Okay, okay. We can deal with that. That means, as a director, I need to assure you that I got your back. I'm not going to let you fail. You know, um, that comes from just being very emotionally intelligent. You know, that takes study. You can't just take an acting class and learn that. You need to read books. You need to, I mean, go to therapy. You go and read therapy books about human behavior. Open yourself up, understand how your own mind works, understand your own insecurities and the way you function. That's how you get to the root. Because you know what? That's what actors are doing in their classes. Most of those acting classes are like therapy sessions. They're unlearning human defenses right. and figuring out ways around them. And the better you get at that, the better you're gonna start spotting things like, say for example, there are some people who freak out in their acting. Like they're, they're like the, the violent <laughs> guy. Like, have you seen this where it's like, they're great at throwing a temper tantrum, but if you're if you study it long enough, you'll start to recognize, oh, that's not acting, that's a show. They're doing that because it looks sexy, but it's not they're not feeling anything. They're they're hiding. They're using that as a smoke screen. So only by study, meticulous study and practices, you'll start to recognize those things. So it's and it's that's that's directing. That's what that's if you study nothing else, that's the skill you should learn. Because there's no trust in that. I, oh, I've, yeah. I've taken acting classes like that. And where people would just be devastated and they'd be crying because one person was coming on to one person and they really liked them and the other person was totally tearing them down and it was just like this devastating thing to watch. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I don't want to sign up for this. Yeah. that's. It happens a lot. It's, yeah, you, I've you heard be, that. Mm -hmm. You know, and if you've seen that happen on set to you as a director, it's your job to protect them. You know? I haven't seen it on set because I haven't, yeah. Yeah, that, it can happen. It's and really? Mm -hmm. That's, a, you know, you as a director, 
you're, you're, you are a protector in a way of sometimes from a scene partner. Sometimes let's say it's a nude scene, understanding that that's humiliating and maybe you don't need to have all these people in the room. Uh, or it's an emotional scene and they're trying to open up and they're having a hard time because there's too many people in the room. Or someone's making jokes over here, like protecting them in that way. Um, sometimes protecting them from themselves is important. Like, like I've had to tell actors, look, we're really wide on this shot, so I'm not reading all the emotion on your face. Say it, don't, don't throw it all out there just yet. Just hold on to some of that. Like, make your movements bigger in this take, but then we're gonna come in for a close up next time. So just, you know, cause that can happen too. They can, they can blow themselves out and we don't even see them in the shot. Um, yeah, you're, that, that comes down to having their back. I'll tell you the, the best thing the way I've gotten the best performances about from an actor, and this is so much fun, is if you get, you shoot your scene, you get it all done, and you still have a little bit of time, and you tell the actor, all right, we've got it in the can, it's all there, this one's for you. You cannot make a mistake, you cannot fail. Now, now try one, just try stuff. They love, I get, every time I've done that, almost every time, that's the take I use. Because they're now, they're, they're operating without a net. They, they know they can't fail. But if you do, this is important, if you do that, if you tell them that, don't direct them. Let them do it. Don't judge what they say. Don't try to curb it again. Just let them, let them do it. If it works, it works. If, if it not, no big deal. We've already got it. You know, and then don't do 50 more takes. Like let that be the last one and then move forward. So uh, uh, yeah, and that's when you get surprised. And that is the joy of filmmaking right there when you are surprised by what the other artists are bringing to the table. That goes for all the departments, by the way. You know, being surprised by what the DP's idea was and you're like, oh man, I never realized that's how cool it could be. That's the fun part of filmmaking. That's what we all want. It's, and it's, when the actors do it, it's nothing better. Nothing better. Because you don't want to push, you know, tear them apart. Sure. Because you know, it's hard. Man, it's hard to do that. It could work. What they're doing is... Yeah. You know, your rest of your crew is more physical. They're not... Have you ever tried crying for 12 straight hours? That's hard to do. Or laughing for straight... You know, or physical comedy or whatever. That's, right. That's a lot. Of, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's true. Did you write the suppression? I did not. I found that script um, through the Austin Film Fest. I went there which by the way, if, you, if you're looking for a festival to go to, it's the Screenwriter Film Festival, best, one of the best I've ever been to. It's, it's four screenwriters. I went, I didn't even have anything in it, but the, the uh, classes and the speakers, the workshops are some of the best I've ever been to. And writers from big shows and big movies are there. You can talk to them, get advice. I was there and I listened to a panel and I met this guy afterwards and good guy. We, you know, he lived in LA, we both met up afterwards for coffee and we became fast friends and he passed me this script and it was one of the best I've ever read. I couldn't put it down. I was just gonna read the opening scene and go to bed and I'm like, I kept reading it like, what is going on? I had to keep going to the next page. Actually, that script taught me a lot about writing, about how to uh, really make an impact with each word and sentence. Um, yeah, so then I found it there and uh, passed it around to a few producers who finally found someone willing to fund it, and away we went. And much of it takes place in one location? It does, yeah. The premise of the film is about a soldier in Iraq who um, is hit with a blinding light in the middle of this firefight, and he wakes up in this 20 by 20 box or room. It's essentially like a prison cell. No doors, no windows, no exits, no furniture. He's got all his stuff, his gun and his radio and everything. He has no idea where he is or who put him there. No one talks to him. And the mystery gets stranger from there. He can't radio out. He, the room starts to change temperature at different points. He's physically pushed because of the things the room is doing to him. Gravity changes at different points, throwing him to the ceiling and the walls and all over the place. Uh, and the room keeps changing shape. It's a bit like, you know, Buried or uh, The Cube. It's got the, that kind of feel, it's a sci-fi thriller with this really great emotional arc to it as well, because it's a soldier 
He was dealing with a lot of PTSD issues and things like that. So he's got this emotional box and a physical box that he's both dealing with at the same time. It, it's just, it's such a cool, cool film. And you're in the editing stages of it? We just finished the first pass, first edit. Not locked yet, but very close. And then what's the plan? What, what do you hope? Festivals or yeah. dis just distribution in theaters? Yeah, we're hoping to, it, it probably won't get into theaters. I mean, the reality, at least nowadays, is that your indie film probably won't go to theaters. Maybe if you have a name in it, you might, but the theaters are now sucked up by the big tentpole movies anymore. So and sadly, that it, it's taken all the real estate. So the realistic thing for an indie filmmaker is hopefully you'll get some get indie run. That's what we're hoping for because we don't have any stars in it. And uh, yeah, hopefully for a good digital release. Well, I'm sure we'll get distribution. The producers have a lot of great connections to that. Um, but we haven't gotten that far in the process. The film's not done yet. So yeah, um, I think it'll go somewhere. I think this film, I mean, everybody, every filmmaker will say this. I think this is a really good film. I think, and it's not just a sci-fi thriller. It has a lot of heart to it and it actually has something to say. So I think that will help. And the performances are, are really good, really, really good. Have you ever thought about just trying to get, you know, producers together to four wall it themselves for a week, you know, like a, a cheaper theater or yeah, it's just not? It's, I have, and I've sort of done that, but that's, that's really a lot of work. You can do it. Um, I, I know people who do it. But to me, like you'll end up spending, you know, your, a year making the film and then five years doing all this impossible legwork to get 25 people to come. I mean, it's just, that's not what I got in this business to do is to, to like rent a theater and ah, that's so, I don't like that kind of work. It's too much. Um, it's a route some people do and some people thrive on, not my personal, I don't want to do that. It's, <laughs> I know this, yeah, it's just not my thing. What are the first few things you do when you start making a movie? Can you take us through like the first month? Yeah. If it's a script that I did not write, um, the first step would be, you know, definitely making sure I understand the script. Um, and you know, I think the process of making a film and making any film project is fairly similar. The, it always starts with the script and making sure that I feel it. Like that's important to me, that it, it kind of makes my heart beat a little bit faster when I read it. Um, so if, if I didn't write it, like smoothing out some of these character transitions, you know, finding, it's important to find themes that mean something to me. Even if it's a movie about time travel, like what's, what makes me, you know, like I know when Zemeckis did Back to the Future, like the idea of hanging, he wondered if he, uh, what it would be like to hang out with his dad in high school and if he'd like him. That's where that came from. And that's what got him up in the morning. That's what really made him connect to that story, right? And that's what made that film so great. So um, I think that's really an important, because that's what's gonna carry you through the whole movie is finding that. Um, Picking your crew then would be like a next big, like you need to find your creative partners. I like to, and of course your cast. I like to cast my crew as well. Um, having good attitudes and good professionals around me is very important. I like to pick people who are better than me. You know, I don't want a DP that I'm better than. I'd rather have someone who pushes me. Um, and who's not a diva, you know, sets are pressure cookers. Uh, it's hard and there will be days where your worst self will come out. You want good people, even though they'll, they may snap when the hour is late. Uh, they're still good people at the end of the day and, and you're okay together. So that's important. I, I really carefully pick those crew people. Um, <clears throat> then I, I'll start as soon as I can on, I like the storyboard. I like to really know shots specifically. Um, at a minimum, at least a shot list of things because your AD is going to want that. Um, I have found that you cannot prepare enough. If the scene is complex, like for example, with suppression, the room changes shape throughout the story. So I actually built miniatures of the sets with little army men 
and in their relation to the size of the set so that I could really understand and kind of get my head around the physicality that we're working with. I'm doing a Star Wars fan film. We're shooting next week. I did the same thing. Like we had a bunch of stormtroopers and we have a, a couple of characters. I, I got little action figures so I could take this fight scene and map it out like and move the characters around just to see the geometry of what we're playing with. That's so helpful for the actors, for the stunt coordinator, for the cinematographer to go, oh, right. I see like everything you can do to help the rest of the crew understand what you're doing better. So storyboards, um, mood boards, finding video clips, showing everyone like, see this scene? This is a scene that I like and I'm trying to emulate. See the colors and the way they splash in the back wall? That helps so much. Speeds the process way up. Because um, the worst thing to do, the killer of creativity is endless explaining on set of what you're trying to achieve and no one understanding it. That's really frustrating and, and slows you down. Um, so yeah, I'm big on storyboards. I love doing those and, and uh, I, I really like the action figures too because it's a lot of fun. Now that said, there are some things you can plan for, which I'll, I'll just acknowledge that going in. I'll try to get some general parameters. For example, like a, say a big dialogue scene where it's two characters, whatever, in a living room. I know that I may hit certain beats. I may map out like, I know that at this point they're gonna be face to face and they're really angry, um, but I don't want them looking at each other at this point. So I might do some of those, but then on set, I'll just kind of organically try to figure it out as we go. Um, that comes also with the preparation because you need to plan for that time to work with the actors for that. So like when you get to set to make sure your AD understands, like I need, a, I need 20 minutes or an hour to walk through the scene with the actors just so everyone knows what's going on. Uh, I think, uh, yeah, so once I have all that done, meeting with the department heads is key. It's kind of surprising to me how, how oftentimes that does not happen but meeting with your production designer, your DP, your ga gaffers sometimes can be helpful. They're good for the location scout, but you know, wardrobe, hair and makeup, all those people, the producers. So, and go through line by line on the script, have the actors there and read the lines if you can. So then if there's any questions, everybody knows the answers. Like, cause things, they'll start asking you questions that you never realize. Oh, I, yeah, no, it's, it's a, it's a pistol. It's not a rifle, it's a pistol. Really? I always thought it was a rifle. Those things will come up if you line. Don't just gloss over a scene, read through it. Because, you know, someone has a question, raise your hand. That's so important. Um, yeah, and the sooner on, don't do that days before. Do that at least a week, couple of weeks before so they have time to go shop if they need to or whatever. Um, yeah, and I... Personally, I like to be physically fit for these things because it's also physically hard to do shooting, like to take time for myself. Like I, I like to get massages while I'm working. Not while I'm working, like in between, <laughs> like once a week right. or leading up because it, you know the stress will make you bind up. So, and I also do a lot of yoga. So like lots of yoga and prep physically for it. Eat very healthy leading up. Try to get as much rest as I can. That's important too, because it will push you. You may end up sick by the end. That happens a lot. Um, yeah, those, those are the main things I would do. And again, you can't prepare enough for these things. Um, there'll always be questions. You, you said it a thousand times and people are gonna go, I don't understand it. That, that just happens. So you actually showed the crew these action figures? Sometimes, yeah. And, and just how, like from, from this like almost looking down like this different perspective mm -hmm. like this 3d sort of thing if this not for every single scene but for certain scenarios yes absolutely uh yeah for action scenes it's really important like to, especially if it's a complex multi-person scene With suppression it was necessary so that we could all understand the size of this room and the shape and what the actor is going to have to be dealing with you know because that that'll adjust the lighting like Okay, the set's now like this and like this. Gaffer can look at that and go, oh, I'm gonna have to rebuild the grid for that. Okay. That means from day one to day two, I gotta change, okay. Okay, good to know that, you know. So that, that's really helpful. It, you're just, you're basically trying to paint as big, clear of a picture for everyone as possible. And then with the corporate videos, 
I'm sure it's a little bit of a different approach, or maybe it's the same, but then you're coming into someone's company and mm -hmm. you're that guy and everyone's like, yeah. oh, <laughs> there he is, there's his director, oh my God, you know? <laughs> and, uh, but, but you're coming into their world, their yeah. set's kind of already built. Yeah, I mean, it's very, very similar. And this is why I think corporate is such good practice because it's the same muscle, same exact thing. It doesn't matter what you're shooting. And, and in some ways it's more important that they understand what you're getting. You don't want them to be surprised at the thing at the end. You know, oh, I, I expected primary colors and you just gave me a contrasty, dark, moody thing. You know, you don't want that. That's bad. They'll never hire you again if that happens. So yeah, being very, very clear showing pictures, um, all of that. In fact, I just had a client meeting today where we discussed colors very specifically. Um, the scripting that I sent them, they said, well, we want, you know, can you make it brighter? Even in the description of the story, like we wanna make sure that when the, we see a kid, we, we don't wanna see kids sick in a hospital bed, we wanna see them on a playground. Good to know, good to know, bright colors. So yeah, very clear. I don't necessarily have to go so far as having department head meeting on some of those things because some of them are simple, but definitely with your group of clients, whatever it is, that's important. How much time did you spend with at the Eagle and Child? Uh, uh, probably a few hours, just one day. Unfortunately, because what an inspirational place that was. I mean, that's where, um, I, what did they call them? The Inklings? Mm -hmm. Groundlings? Inkling, Inklings. It's C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien and a few others, though I don't remember their names, but they got together and they talked about storytelling and they, you know, that's where Lord of the Rings was invented. That's where the Chronicles of Narnia were invented. These great minds would go there and as a group, they'd over beers or whatever, they would talk about their, oh, you can go in and sit at the very booths that they sat at and, and just marinate. And it was such a, yeah, I tried to spend there as long as I can. I actually worked on some stories while I was there just because, you know, you're in the presence of where great stories were born. Um, yeah, and because I was visiting, I couldn't, you know, we had a one day in that area. So like, um, I couldn't spend as long as I wanted, but it was worth, it was so great to spend just the time that I did. I drew out some storyboards as well. And yeah, that was a really cool place. It's in, in Cambridge, I believe, or Oxford in Oxford, um, because they were both, uh, C.S. Lewis and, and Tolkien were both professors there. So that's where they would go and hang out after work, so. And you did a video, I think, for your channel, and you said that filmmakers should find their mecca. Yeah. You kind of yeah. use that as a... Find your mecca, finding your place that inspires you, because sometimes you need to return to that. I think um, there are certain, I think we as humans are drawn to locations and people that inspire i mean you know this is why we like when we go to a town where such and such a film was shot to actually go and visit that location and how magical that can feel i'm sure you felt that like you know what i mean like i know like for example i grew up in portland oregon the goonies were shot in astoria so like there's the goonie house you can go see it like they don't like it because there's just people that live there but you can drive past and like oh my gosh that's where you know chunk did his you know, I forget the name of his dance, but the little dance. Uh, like, there's a magic to that. There's a, there's a really cool element. And I think whatever it is, whatever inspires you, um, find it. Because sometimes when the days get dark and the discouragement sets in to go refine that, re, you know, to find those things to reinvigorate you, it is important to rediscover, because it re helps you rediscover the love of what we get to do. No, Ursula K. Le Guin, she was from, was she from Portland or no? Or I know she's I from Berkeley, I think, but then. I'm not sure. She lives there? Oh, okay. I'm not sure. Chuck Palahniuk's from Portland. I don't oh, know. okay. Yeah, which makes a lot of sense. <laughs> when you read his work and you go, oh yeah, sounds like you have in Portland. Yeah. Fight Club, I can totally see that happening in Portland. Yeah. <laughs> so. When should someone quit their job to become a filmmaker? As soon as you can, you know, because I mean, think about it, like you know, what the rule of thumb is, you know, it takes 10,000 hours to master your craft. And the longer you take to get those hours, the longer it's going to take to really kind of get a handle on this. Because directing takes a lot of time. It takes a many, many, many years to like really understand all the aspects of the business. So 
I know at first it could be a challenge, you know, because you're fresh out of school or whatever. But as soon as you can get, I know when I first started, it was really hard for me because I was working, I was working at a computer repair center. And I knew that every hour I was spending there is one hour I was not spending on set or writing or whatever. Um, Windows 95 you were working on? Or what? I believe it was. <laughs> I, that was where I saw my first one gigabyte hard drive. So like, but I remember sitting in the, the break room at lunchtime. I would sit there and I'd look out the window and I'd see all the cars going past me, knowing they're all going somewhere and I was not. Um, you got to get out of that as fast as you can. Find some way to make a living in this business as quickly as you possibly can. Even if it's PAing on a, you know, some big whatever, on the smallest movie ever, you're practicing. At least you're on the ladder. At least you're, you're observing filmmaking. Even if you're catering, you're on the set and you're watching the action. It doesn't matter. Get there somehow as fast as you possibly can. Before school, even. While you're in school, even better, you know? I mean, there's, there's people who have interned for me who are high school students, which I'm like, man, I wish I could have done that in high school. It would put me so far ahead. Um, yeah. Yeah. And if you could find a way to make a living in some aspect of this industry, do it. How'd you leave that job? Uh, it was, I got to a point where I just couldn't do it anymore. I, it just hit a breaking point. Like I had, I had to go and I saw wasn't even an opportunity. It was just someone suggesting I move to a new city where stuff was being made. And so abandoning all, I went. And it started my life. Like it, it was worth it. It was hard because I had no friends. I was on the other, literally on the other side of the country, diagonally from where I was. And I, it changed everything. Got it all started. So... Did you ever think, oh, I should have stayed there Never. for like a, just a, the first week? Not once, mm -hmm. not once. It, uh, yeah, it's that's the thing about there's terror in moving place. You know, it's relocating to another city, leaving everyone behind. There's a fear in that, but you know, as soon as you do it, even when you land, it's usually like, yeah, I, this is a good thing. Um, you know, that's usually the question for LA for a lot of people: should I move to LA or whatever? And that's the that's the fear that you're gonna regret once you get there. Um, I don't know, I feel like most people don't. A few leave, but I feel like most people probably don't. Um, you know, I should say something about LA, the LA mentality, the LA thing. Everyone who doesn't live in LA probably on some level asks and wonders if they should live in LA. LA is not the answer to everything. It all depends on what you want to do. Um, there is this funny belief. This is what I hear people say a lot. Oh, I'll come to LA when I need to. They'll say that. And they'll say, I'll fly in for any meeting. Now that is predicated on this belief that the break comes down to the meeting. Well, that's okay. at the end that can be where it happens. You know, you have the meeting that changes everything. But what you're, you're not realizing is, is that there's a buildup to that. It's a who you know industry. Um, and if you're trying to get into those upper echelon of work, you have to know the right people. And it, that is not at the meeting. That happens at someone's birthday party. That happens at, you know, I, met, I went to play paintball with a buddy a week ago and I met of several industry people that could totally make my career, you know, a week ago, like at paintball, like that's not the kind you're gonna fly in for, right? That's, that's the importance of relationships. And um, believe me, it matters who you know. I don't care how talented you are. If you don't know anybody, your road is gonna be long and hard. Someone asked me once a long, long time ago, if they thought I worked, they said, do you think you've worked harder than J.J. Abrams? And that was a tough question because I was like, and I didn't live in LA at the time. And I thought, no, I don't think I have. I, I think that we've probably both worked very hard, just as hard, because I work very hard. Well, then what is it about him that puts him where he is and me where I am? Well, his dad was in the industry and he was editing home videos for Steven Spielberg when he was in high school. That he was groomed to be where he is. Now, I'm not saying he didn't earn it. He's worked very hard, clearly. He's very good at what he does. 
but he knew the right people. That is, that changes your career right there. You have to live, if you want to be in those upper echelons of things, you better live here. If you're fine with not working in that, then you don't have to come. That's kind of what it comes down to. Can you tell us your biggest success that you've had in your career? What was something where you said, wow, this is, this is how I imagined it, or this is a step closer to how I imagined it? Oh, that's a tough, that's a, that's a good question too, because there are like, bullet points for sure. Like, I want to say it was the Record Keeper film. Like, that felt like a big success, even though it, it did not, um, was not released and did not turn out the way I thought it would. What it did, though, was it changed my perspective on things, and I learned a lot, and I met a lot of amazing artists that have helped me. Success doesn't necessarily mean moving up in your pay scale or, you know, getting a contract or whatever. It, it could mean other things. Like that film, you know, I got to experiment on a level I haven't been to before. So I would call that a huge success. But the suppression that I just did also was, uh, was a bigger success because that one was a film I made in LA with LA producers for the first time. So that, even though it was a smaller budget than The Record Keeper, to me that still felt like a bigger accomplishment. Um, and oddly enough, this fan film that I'm about to direct, it's for Star Wars, Star Wars fan film, feels like even the biggest opportunity because the things that we're getting to do with this, I mean, we're getting, we're getting like one of the actors that we're getting for it is the voice of Obi-Wan Kenobi in all the cartoons. Oh, wow. And he's in our fan film. Like we're getting people who've worked on Star Wars films to work on this. It's turning out to be one of the biggest fan films ever made. And it feels like one of the biggest things I've ever done. It's really exciting. And we're playing with Star Wars. How cool is that? You know, you know no one's getting paid. You know, I mean, there's, there's a little bit of a budget, but you know, we're not, this is not a buy an island and retire kind of project. But you know, uh, big opportunities and big success looks a little different a lot of the times. Like you know, the Star Wars thing. It's not a moneymaker. It's an opportunity. Um, the same with suppression. That was not a moneymaker either. The budget was not huge, but it was a great working relationship with a production company that I admire, who makes lots and lots of films. These guys are, I'm gonna work with them for the rest of my life, I am, no doubt. Like, good, good people. Like, Record Keeper was also a big success, never released, but it changed my, the whole trajectory of my life. So, I guess it would be those three big bullet points, um, yeah. And they all look different. They're all like all over the scale, if that makes sense. It does. Would you say that to someone that's either entering film school or whether they're learning on their own, just that you will have these, these like little pins on a map yes. kind of thing? And yeah. some of them will leave you with a feeling that maybe it's not so great, but it'll teach you a lot. Yes. Others will give you just an amazing high. Maybe it won't pay anything. Mm -hmm. But there's value in that too. That is the re that is so realistic. That is exactly how it happens. You know, you might work on a TV show and get paid six figures for two weeks of work, but it might be it might suck. You know, you could call that a success on your IMDb page, and that would be cool. But the the experience was hard, and you would get more enjoyment out of this little music video that you made that you know, just went little ways, but it was so much fun to do it. And the artists were so great and it looks better on your reel than the TV show. Like that, that, you know, it just, it looks different. And this is what I mean where it's like, we've all been sold on this idea of success. Well, it just constantly changes. You don't know what it, it you need to be open to that of open your eyes and look at where you are realistically on what opportunity you're being presented with. Like, Actually, speaking of music videos, I did a music video many, many years ago that the budget was incredibly small, but I would consider, that was a big success for me back at the time. Um, we had no money, we made this Western, like a shootout, and it was so much fun to do. I got to play with cowboys and things, and we ended up winning the Nashville Film Festival for best music video. We beat out big national acts for that prize. That was a big deal at that time because you know, it's Nashville, it's Music City. So like winning best music video was a big deal. And we had like no money. So it was like, that was a huge success. Um, you know, I didn't make much, any money on it, but who cares? That was, I'm so proud of that still to this day. It's one of my proudest accomplishments.
So yeah, it's that's that's the way it is. That's the way it, what it looks like. Did you see Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Yes. So without, you know, maybe focusing on story or violence or whatever, but just the three different sort of stages or, or levels and ideas of people's career where <laughs> one seems kind of content, uh -huh. even though he's not really doing that much. I know. One is actually, seems like he's actually doing all right, but he feels like he's falling from yeah. grace and he's very bitter about it. And then the other one, she doesn't know it, but things will take a dark turn, but it's right. just an interesting look at sort of three it's, careers. And that's real. That's the way it always is, you know? Mm. Yeah, you like you look at the main character who's doing movies and stuff and he's angry. He's totally pissed it's like, off. like, man. <laughs> Margaritas has a beautiful pool and he's yeah, right, yelling at someone. <laughs> he's like angry. It's like, wait a minute, why are you angry? You know what you got? Ah. That energy can destroy your um, uh, opportunities. I really feel that way. Like you, you are bitter and angry about something like that. And of course, you know, once upon a time in Hollywood is a certain guy, but like all of us can have that on any kind of level. Like, sure. I don't care what gig you've got. Um, someone else probably wants it. You beat someone else out for that job and they wish that they had it. And if you're bitter about it, well then, why are you even in this business? Like, maybe you should look at another line of work if you're gonna be angry about what you fought for and won. So, it's so important to check yourself on these things. And that can affect what you're getting in the future, your energy that you're putting out there. Yeah, and I think that what was interesting is just sort of like Leo was afraid of his fall from grace yeah. because he was getting older. And so that's where it came from. And he kept yeah. measuring himself. And, and you know, that's a very real thing, I get it. But it just even his statements to the, the child actor, like, oh yeah, you got another good 15 years and then you'll see what I'm talking about. Right, well, and that's, that's a realistic problem that also is, is something that people don't talk about is you do something really big, but then after that, you know, the depression that can come from um, falling off of a big project or maybe the fear of, oh, I'll never do anything like this again that happens. It does happen. Um, you lose a big client and you know, now you got to scrounge around for low budget work again. Like that, that's so real. That happens so often. And it's, what do you do in those scenarios? If I figure that out, I'll let you know. Cause it's, it's, uh, that may be time for reinvention or reawakening or something.